Next thing on our agenda is to um, adopt the agenda. Is there any additions or deletions? Mr. Chairman. Yes, sir. I move that we adopt the agenda with the additions as presented. Shall I read them? I had a report from Dr. Chris Fowler with Warren County Public Schools and reorder. Number two, reorder the agenda to, to place all reports before the public comment period, including Warren County Public Schools, the, the, the Department of Transportation, the Department of Social Services, and the Virginia Cooperative Extension Office. And number three, reorder the agenda to place the unfinished business item before the public comment period. And number four, remove item K6 from the agenda. And number five, add an item to the consent agenda as K13 for the authorization to advertise for a public hearing and ordinance to add and ordain section 30-6 of the Warren County Code to add a one-time bonus for compensation board funded sheriff and sheriff's deputy in for year 2020 and 21. And number six, amend the motion for item O to an additional 500,000 for a total maximum appropriation of $1 million. Is there a motion to adopt the agenda as presented? Oh, excuse me, uh, as amended? So moved. Is there a second? Second. Uh, Emily, could we get a roll call, please? Mr. Carter. Aye. Ms. Oates. Aye. Mr. Chairman. Aye. Ms. Cullors. Aye. Mr. Fox. Aye. Is Mr. Berenger here yet? Yes, sir. He's in the Oh, excuse me, Dr. Ballinger, my apologies. Um, could we get your presentation, please? Thank you. Good morning. Good morning, sir. Hope everybody's doing well today. Um, we're in the ninth week of, of school, and um, will you take your mask off so I can hear you? I'm sorry. I, I can I can speak louder if you want me to. Be good. I, I have that gym voice, so <laughs> sometimes people tell me I, I, I overpower, but um, so I, I can actually speak up a little bit. Uh, we are in our ninth week of school, and you know, right now we we have had some cases uh, in the schools, but our cases are are not attributed to community spread in the school it's it's attributed to activities outside in the community and you know i we we have done a great job with with monitoring with tracing um and and really our success goes to our staff our parents for self-monitoring and and reporting when they when they when they have symptoms and or the communication between the the staff and the and the parents with with the school system so that we can work together in in unison to to make sure that we combat this um, and also with our mitigation strategies so so our mitigation strategies has really helped us as well with what we have in place with our within our schools so we have had a few cases where there was exposure in the school but due to our mitigation strategies and due to the due diligence of uh, of staff members uh you know with with making sure that those are implemented on a daily basis there even though there was some exposure in a few cases uh, we have not had any other cases come out from that exposure within the schools so that is really a testament to 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 what we have set up in our school system and and the and the job that that the faculty and staff and parents just our community as a whole how they are all working together within for the school system and the betterment of our children um you know right now we are you know we are looking at trying to to add additional days for our secondary students um i was out at, at skyline high school uh oh a couple weeks ago and I was able to to set in on some classes with students and and listen to what their needs were and what 
their desires were and, and things that they were struggling with. And so listening to those students is powerful and, and trying to understand that, you know, and to let them know that we're here to support them, that we need to hear their voice to make sure that we're able to do the job that we need to do for them. And, and that was one of the things that, that really the students brought up that we need additional days. We need to be in here because for, for some students, the virtual learning is a little more difficult. We understand that. So, <clears throat> you know, I will also say that at the secondary level, our schools are doing a great job with 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 bringing students in on additional days that maybe is not their their designated day. So, for instance, uh, Warren County High School, their day is Monday and Tuesday, um, but the the teachers and the and the administration at Warren County High School work with students to bring them in on on individual basis or in small groups on Wednesday, Thursday and Friday to to help those students that that may be struggling with with some of the virtual side of things. Um, so so we are looking at additional days at the secondary level. And I think that when when you you do that, you also have to consider the social emotional learning that, that our students are facing right now and, and, and how not having that interaction with, with either the teacher or maybe with some other students that, that, that can be detrimental to them as well. And so, you know, when, when we think about educating the entire child, it's not just knowledge. You know, it's not just the textbooks. There, there's other things that, that play into educating the overall and well-being of, of the child. So, you know, that's, that's kind of where we're at right now. We're, we're moving forward. Things are, you know, we had a reboot at the high school a couple of weeks ago. Uh, we, we identified some things that we were struggling with uh, virtually and, and took a step back to understand what we needed to address. We are going to next week have a reboot at the pre-K kindergarten level um, because their, their devices came in, you know, with, with your support, their devices have, have been in and, and we are now going to do a reboot to allow, to allow those students to, and teachers and families to, to take that week to go back through the new device within the new system so that we can, can move forward. Because, you know, as, at some point in time, there may come a time that we need to, to close a school or that we may need to close the entire system. And, and we need to prepare for that. So we're going to use the reboot next week with, uh, with our pre-K kindergartners to, to help us transition when that, when that occurs. So um, also we, we, we have some other devices coming in. You know, we, we were surprised to receive um, additional funding from uh, the Coronavirus Relief Act that we, we did not intend to get. And, um, and so we, we are putting that in place to help us with our mitigation strategies. Um, you know, we, we are going to have uh, some, some thermal scanners that will be able to, to capture a large group of people as they're, they're coming in. Because right now, we, we still see that VHSL, the plan is to continue starting in, in December. They, they are putting some things in place. And so we have to be able to get that, uh, you know, we have to be able to take those temperatures as, as large groups come in. It's, it's, it would slow things down if we're having to use our, our current hand scanners to get that done. Um, so, so we're using, using funds for that. We're also increasing our virtual presence. So a lot of online um, textbook components, a lot of online resources for our, our students and our teachers. But right now things are, are moving in a positive direction. We continue to adapt on a daily basis as everybody has found out that in this pandemic, you have to adapt and our plan when we started our plan we thought we had a good idea it was a good idea but every good idea needs to be adjusted um, every plan has to go through adjustments and we adjust on a daily basis um, you know as we work through these cases well, you know when we get a report from 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 a parent or a staff member uh, we do our due diligence on a daily basis and and these things don't you know, we don't fly through these within, within a few minutes of figuring out what we need to do. It takes time with getting with the contact tracers, making, uh, getting in communication with uh, 
Lord Fairfax Health Department and seeking their guidance. And so a lot of times as we move through this, you can see that some of these situations when we're, when we're working through, you know, is it an isolation? Is it a quarantine? Is it a contact? How long? Sometimes that can take up to two hours to, to work through those things. But, you know, we have a team that works on that on a daily basis and, and we work through it as, as quick as we can, but making sure that we're doing our due diligence as we move through that. So things are going well um, right now. The main thing is we have had not had any community spread in the schools and, and that's the positive for, for us. So any other questions? Questions from anyone? Thank you, sir. Thank you. Next presentation is from uh, Samantha Barber. Is Samantha available? take my mask off I don't have a, a gym voice I do have a passionate voice but not a gym <laughs> voice like Dr. Ballinger <laughs> um, I have some things for you all may I approach yes ma'am so I need to put my mask back on Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Thank you. So, Chairman, voters, supervisors, thank you so much uh, for uh, giving me the opportunity uh, to speak with you this morning on. Uh, behalf of reaching out now. Um, my name is Samantha Barber, and I am president and founder of uh, uh, this organization. Um, reaching out now is uh, it's an entity that started back in 2008 uh, in Charles County, Maryland. Um, the organization was uh, established to support uh, students and teachers um, in the Charles County area in Maryland. Uh, we were ex uh, we worked through uh, the school system uh, to support low-income families and also to support teachers. Uh, we, were, um, we worked through that for about five years, and back in 2014, uh, you know, our children began to get older. So my husband and I made the difficult decision to uh, lay the account, the organization dormant for a while. And uh, back in 2008, uh, back in 2008, when we started the organization, we believed that um, there was a need uh, for support when it comes to low-income families. And through our programs, uh, we established backpack, you know, backpack programs, uh, feeding programs. Uh, but then we began to transition to uh, supporting young girls and young boys through a leadership and a mentorship program. Uh, when the account, when the organization became dormant, we, uh, I decided to go back into the workforce. I worked at T.C. Williams High School um, from 2014, and there, just the wisdom and knowledge of college and career readiness, um, you know, supporting students beyond just, um, oh, <laughs> got a little louder there, <laughs> supporting students uh, just beyond the classroom. Um, that there was a, a need for the whole child and the whole family. Am I too close? I um, lean in when it does that. Okay. Um, for the whole family, and thus we um, transitioned more as to what was needed to support not just the students, but you can feed a child, 
you know, and you can educate a child, but what were some of the other things that was going on, you know, in the home? So we became more or less of a community organization. And from that, we thrived from serving three schools to serving 34 schools in the county. Uh, so when we did close the organization, it was very difficult um, because we were leaving behind a family. A family moved to Alexandria City. And um, picking up from there and learning even more about um, the need of students that were just suffering from different issues, from um, low self-esteem to uh, you know being in a single parent home, being in a home where they're um, were Spanish Spanish speaking, and um, learning and growing from that. Uh, was great for me. I didn't know that until, of course, I moved here back in 2018, um, where I met with the administrators at um, Skyline Middle School about what were some of the needs that they were seeing within the schools and and thrusted me back into reopen opening the organization. Um, and thus the journey of reaching out now uh, in Warren County. Um, we've been very, very blessed to have the school community support. Um, we wanted to start to start small, so we started in Skyline Middle School um, through our girls program, and that was called that's called the Girl of Destiny Leadership Program. Um, we started with 18 girls, um, and there was a criteria, and we worked from um, the NASCA framework of college and career readiness, academic literacy character development, and community leadership. And from that framework, we built a curriculum through, throughout this for the school year uh, where we implemented workshops for our students. And um, COVID, of course, happened. So we were only able to have 16, um, 16 workshops uh, from September of last year to February of this year. Um, and we also incorporated workshops right before uh, COVID happened. Uh, we had uh, created a partnership with James Madison University where we were gonna take the girls to tour and visit and, and um, just understand how it feels to be on a college campus. Um, and we also uh, had plans was to take them to Lord Fairfax Community College. Um, and also to look at technical um, technical opportunities because we understand we need to be inclusive because not all children go to college. We do have some that want you know want to go into cosmetology or automotive or being a steam fitter. So uh, in looking at at that, we um, we begin to tailor tailor the direction of what each each student wanted to do um, as they aspire to go on to high school. And not just staying with them in the middle school, but our plans was to continue with them through post-secondary. Uh, we currently have um, nine girls who are in um, ninth grade right now. And um, we've already met with Dr. Smith even before COVID as to how we can transition the program continuing at Skyline Middle School, but transferring, tr transitioning the program to Skyline High School. Uh, said COVID happened, and um, we had to look at, okay, how can we continue to be a support to our school community, and how can we continue to be a support to our girls? Uh, we started with uh, drive-by with love, um, and what that was, we weren't able to go into the school system, of course, because school was closed, so what we did, we partnered, again, with businesses in the community, uh, Crazy Willie, um, <laughs> uh, we had a fun ice cream day with the girls. Um, down, down Home Comfort Bakery, the girls had sweet treats. Uh, Lido's Pizza, we had a pizza party for them. So one, one Thursday out of every month, we connected with them. And we had a surprise day as well where we packed their bags with little trinkets and we dispersed and we showed up at their homes with these little bags and balloons and, and things just to let them feel like, you know what, we care and we love them. But again, we realized that there was more. They needed more than just sweet treats. They needed more than just a, a party. Um, because of course, uh, we had students who were home um, not just our girls, but we had other students that was home that needed 
support in other ways and um, talking to wisdom, um, principles of um, what is it, what more, what more can we do? Because we can go into the schools, so how can we help to supplement and be an additional source of support to our families in our public school? Um, and we know that the schools were feeding uh, the students. Uh, we had different bus routes that was going to different areas, you know, to deliver breakfast and lunch and, and, and things like that. Um, and so I spoke with, um, with Shane, Shane Goodwin, um, and a couple of our par um, community partners, uh, Front Royal Women Resource Center, uh, the Elks, um, Rotary Club of Warren County and Warren Coalition is to, okay, what are some of the things that is going on? Because we didn't want to reinvent, we wanted to be an additional support, not trying to do something that uh, the other systems were doing. And um, New Hope Bible Church, Virginia Hills Church, uh, some of our local churches, it's like what were they doing? First Baptist Church, you know, they were feeding the homeless. Uh, so, um, and again, listening to wisdom and having conversations, we came up with a program that was called Giving to Give Back. And our businesses were hurting, our community, um, some in our communities, in our school communities, needed that additional um, support. So, uh, in partnering with the principals, uh, speaking with, um, with, uh, with Jane Baker from Blue Ridge Technical Center and Devin Smith, we came up with an idea of delivering meals three times a week. Uh, we started out with 25 families. We started April 1st, and by the end of uh, June, we were delivering um, meals to 65 families, 16, 16 routes, um, over 700 meals a week, uh, to 65 families in our community. Uh, we thought that we were just going to be doing that for a month, and it, said it lasted for three months. Um, we, our, our community rallied around reaching out now, because the secret joke, which is not going to be a secret anymore, is when I spoke with Shane and Michelle Smelter from um, uh, from the Department of Social Services, I was like, guys, you know, I really want to do this, but all we have is $600. <laughs> you know, um, so we need to really rally around together, ra rally the community, not a campaign, but how can we come together through a really difficult time in our community? And um, the support has been amazing um, through our partners, through the principals, uh, the relationship of growing and building as an organization, as a community organization, came out of actually COVID-19. And um, back in July, after we were done, we sent out surveys to all the 65 families. And just in asking them, how was it? We didn't want to give them a handout. We didn't want it to seem like, you know, we're, we're just doing this for you. We care and we want to know how you are, how are you doing, how was it to, 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 to support and, and be there for you because not just sending you a meal, but we send cards every Monday to, um, to each of the family that we served. Um, and the police department also chipped in, Captain Crystal Klein and Chief McGillis. Uh, they came out and they too delivered um, to, to our families. Uh, Crystal and her family purchased um, essentials to all 65 families where we were able to send shampoos and conditioners and things like that every month for the three months that we were supporting our families. And thus, what you're seeing in front of you, where it says, you know, writing the vision and having the fate to move forward. After giving to give back was, was over, uh, and the support that we received and the notes that we received, we realized that there was a, a different need within everything that we're doing. So uh, are we going to continue on the refocus, or are we going to revert back to what, where we was and what we were doing in the past? which of course is leadership and it's important. So that's what you're seeing in front of you is the new reaching out now. Um, a year ago, uh, almost a year ago when I spoke before the, school, before the school board, it was leadership, it was the direction of supporting our young girls, but now our focus is leadership, 
empowerment, and service. And under each of those avenues, you will see our service program, you'll see our leadership program, and you'll see our empowerment program. Our empowerment program started at Skyline Middle School. We had the very first um, career day. Uh, Dr. Daly was there, uh, who um, uh, was represented the government, and we had uh, 16, 23 different presenters from 16 different clusters in our community, and we had 600 students who participated in um, Career Day, which was your passport to success. So that is a part of our um, our empowerment piece, where we're hoping to do a decision day for our seniors, another career day at this at the middle school and the high school, uh, military day to give our students and families an option of the path that we want them, that we're hoping that they will take after post-secondary and the importance of school, the importance of going to school, um, because it's one step after another step after another step. And of course, our leadership piece is our girls program, the Girl of Destiny Leadership Program. And we're also implementing a boys program that's called Lotus, uh, leading others to understand success. That was a program that we had when we, when we were in <coughs> Ireland. But again, we wanted to start, we wanted to lay a foundation in our community, not just coming out and saying we're doing this and we're doing that, but starting in the middle, starting with our middle school, and now we're moving over to Skyline High School and also supporting E. Wilson. Um, but branching out slowly, um, because we want to be effective and efficient, um, not quantity, but quality in, in supporting and serving our students. Um, so that, that's reaching out now, and, and thank you so much for giving us the opportunity again to, to come before you. Um, you know, we're blessed to be here, we're blessed to have the partners that we have, and we're truly blessed to have the community support that we have. Any questions? Questions from the board? Uh, comments? Uh, our comment is, uh, we appreciate you being here, and that reaching out now is just one organization that's having a positive impact on our community by helping young people reach their full potential. And you all are just one of many organizations who are helping our citizens in most need. Whether it's reaching out now, House of Hope, CCAP, St. Luke's Clinic, the Phoenix Project, the churches, and many more, they're out there helping. Thank you. But they cannot do it alone. They need the entire community's help. Whether it's volunteering your time or money, reach out now, no pun intended, and help these organizations help others. Thank, Thank you, you. ma'am. Thank you. Thank you very much. And um, if I would be allowed Samantha, as well. Samantha, I yes. would like to hear more at some other time about the, yeah. the boys program. Um, it, so it, through my efforts in the community and working, I've worked with young women, teen moms as well. Yes. But we've identified there's a gap for young men in our community to have mentorship, leadership, to realize their full potential. Yes. And so I'd like to understand what the boys program that you want to set up is about sure, and how you sure. are going to implement and seek out these young men to mentor. Yes, um, I would love to. Uh, it's part of it, of course, is written in the, the vision plan. But what leading others to understand success, just a, a little bit, is I'm working with Devin Smith. Um, so Devin is, uh, he is amazing. Um, he's my adopted brother. I've adopted him and his family. <laughs> he's great, yeah. Um, we, he's going to be leading the program. And what we're doing is, of course, um, psychology, you know, that m mental makeup of of how can we reach you you know i'm a girly girl so they may listen to me on some things about love and comfort and support but those hardcore things of how do you shake a hand how do you prepare yourself for the next step and um again college and career readiness uh, or workforce readiness that we're moving towards because sometimes when kids hear college and career readiness they're like uh college career I, I have no idea what that is so when we put a spin on it and said workforce readiness and taking the steps from middle school to high school it's compounding on each other and okay what's what's next for me and just simple things of learning to cook you know um, of how do I change a tire you know how do I 
uh, present myself for an interview. Uh, so we are really, really excited um, when it was presented to us to start a, bo a boys program. And I did have a friend who created the framework, which you, you'll see is a little bit different from the girls program because we know that they're tailored differently. And wanting to have something from Shane's program uh, that he started at E. Wilson, the big program, to have a transition, not just leaving them in the middle, right. in the elementary school to say, okay, big is done. You, you're now in the middle school and there's nothing for you. So it's working with Shane as the boys move up. And also um, we've already spoken with, with, with um, Bobby Johnston and he's excited about it. Um, so that in a nutshell, but yes, definitely would love to chat with you more, more about it. Um, and um, just as far as community, if I will be allowed as well, we are having a light in the darkness community prayer vigil uh, this Sunday. Um, at five, I do have some flyers that I'd love to give you all, uh, but we'd love to see you all come out to to support Pastor Bobby Stepp is going to is going to be our our speaker at the event, and we also have Christy Goodwin, um, Shane's wife, and Pastor Ingrid, who will be doing the lighting and other pastors that we've um, invited, and of course community leaders and partners. So we'd love to see you out there as well. And I have some flyers. Do you have a fair amount of those where you could leave them on the table back there for yes, people sir. to get out? Yes, sir. Um, I understand your passion and I appreciate it. Um, I hope you continue to look into the other organizations so you're not duplicating efforts. So you're actually helping each other help each other. Very true. Partnership is very important to reaching out now. Yes. Um, and uh, working with Warren Coalition, um, which are also in the public school, uh, Krista Shiflett. Um, and working with uh, Front Royal Women Resource Center, uh, who gave, gave us the grant to support our young girls. Um, and what we did with giving to give back, not duplicating, but reaching out and working together to support um, and meeting the needs of our students. Yeah, I, I understand your passion. We could go on and on all day. <laughs> yes, very true. I'm not trying to take anything away from you at all. I, I, you, I really enjoy the passion. Thank you, appreciate it. Is your contact information in here? I do have business cards. That, um, yeah, I'd appreciate update. one of those because I too would like to have more conversation, but it could take all day too, so we Thank won't you. do that. Thank you, thank you, Ms. Colors. Thank you for what you're doing. Thank you for your time. Thank you, thank you very much. Next item on our agenda is the Virginia Department of Transportation, Mr. Carter. Morning, Mr. Chairman, board members. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, before I give my report, uh, I think the board requested uh, to meet our new superintendent. And I have him with me today, so I'm going to ask him to stand up along with uh, my maintenance operations manager, uh, Dean Schellenberg. Pull your mask down there, Dean. I don't think you'll get anything so they can see. Yeah, we'd, we'd like to see who you are. <laughs> and uh, Charlie Monroe is our maintenance operations manager. Dean, of course, is responsible uh, for the Front Royal Area Headquarters. We have six area headquarters in our residency, and Charlie's responsible for all six of them. So uh, the board has been very kind with their accolades uh, and the amount of work that we're getting done, and these are really the gentlemen that are responsible for that work. So uh, I hope that any issues that you have, that you... Uh, you haven't been bashful in the past, and I hope you'll not be bashful in the future <laughs> to let us know. And we'll certainly try to address those that we can. Our re maintenance for this uh, past month and the upcoming month, we've completed 95% of our fall mowing on the primaries. That's our fence to fence and brush cutting. And we'll complete the remainder this month. And we begin mowing our slopes. We have a robotic slope mower that uh, can go out and do the steep slopes that we can't put our normal tractors and things on. And a man controls it uh, from a remote control on the ground. So you'll want, probably see that out on the side of the road. It's, 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 excuse me, it's interesting to watch as long as you can get safely off the road. 
Uh, we swept all the bridges on our primaries and our high volume secondaries. We performed skin patching on Panhandle Road at the Low Water Bridge. And we started skin patching on uh, Oregon Hollow Road. And we will continue on Oregon Hollow Road this month. Our state forces completed the rural rustic uh, section in uh, the middle of Cawthorn Mill Road. And <clears throat> they will be also working this month to extend the northbound right turn lane on Route 340 at Poorhouse Road. We will be repairing the slope failure on uh, 340 at the Hillbilly Salvage Yard this month. And they have uh, been conducting their usual grading operations and stone applications on our non-hard surface roads. That's a year-round process, so we'll be continuing that this month. Uh, not on your report, but a brief update. Uh, we had been very fortunate in in our residency and indeed the Stanton District over the summer to avoid COVID exposures. Okay, that is not the case now. We have experienced some. Uh, we're taking every protocol that's recommended and some additional to try and keep our people safe. Uh, some things that you might see out there, uh, we try to keep one person in a vehicle so ordinarily where we might take three or four folks out in one vehicle, now we're taking three or four vehicles out to try and limit that exposure. So you might see additional vehicles on the job site and you wonder why that's the reason. Uh, we try to keep the same teams together where possible. If, if we have a mowing crew that's doing the mowing, we keep those same people as opposed to rotating them around so that the exposure is limited. Most of our exposure cases have come from outside the department, where someone on off hours has uh, come in contact with someone who's tested positive. In the Edinburgh residency, we've only had two positive cases. They were mild, and uh, they've since returned to work. But we have several cases where uh, a family member or uh, uh, boyfriend, girlfriend, whatever, has tested positive, and that forces a 14-day quarantine for our folks. So uh, we're doing all we can to curtail it, but it is with us, and it looks like it's going to be with us for a while. Under projects, uh, we have completed all the rural rustics that we had scheduled for this year. Um, they're done now. Uh, 2021 is coming up. Uh, I will be meeting with the board the latter part of this year or the first of next year in the work session. We're going to be less aggressive with rural rustics next year for a couple of reasons. Uh, budget constraints and uh, we overspent some areas this year so we're going to have to pull back some of those funds to cover those expenditures. But When we sit down in a work session I'll go over each of those and the board will still be able to input what their priorities are with what we have to work with. We made some temporary pavement repairs. So the southbound left lane turn uh, left turn lane on the eastbound I-66 on 522 and 340 under the bridge. Uh, that's rutted out pretty bad, uh, mostly due to the amount of truck traffic and heavy mm -hmm. trucks. Uh, we're, we're scheduling a pavement milling and pavement repairs before winter, and we just received word uh, this morning, Dean, this morning that the, uh, the contractor is looking to either do that this coming Friday or next Monday. So there will be some traffic delays there. Uh, we're asking law enforcement to assist us and it looks like about uh, five hours worth of work to mill it and, and put it back. Are there any other, oh, uh, I was also asked to talk about utility right away and tree trimming. Okay. All right, when we grant the utility company, be it power or telephone, uh, uh, permission to use our right of way, okay. There's nothing in the agreement that says they have to trim their portion of it. We trim 
uh, uh, twice a year, okay, in the spring and in the fall. And if trees grow up into the utility lines, sometimes our contractor will address it and sometimes they will not, especially if it's power for a uh, safety purposes, our contractor usually won't touch it, okay? And that ref we refer back to the power company to have to address that. Or if the tree is in danger of falling and damaging a uh, communications line, our contractor may pass on it and we refer that back to the utility company. Now, does uh, that automatically happen? Yes, sir. Okay, thank you. I'm sorry. Does that automatically happen? Well, I mean, yes. If it doesn't, if if you can't do it or you choose not to do it, do you automatically call? We contact the okay. power company and tell them that, or the, the telephone company and say, this is one that, that we can't take down without uh, uh, endangering your facility up there. I think the question probably came from me because I had an area where constituents called me and then I called the telephone company. The power company's wonderful. If you say there's an issue with their line, they're there, they take care of it. Um, what I was told by the, power, the telephone company was, it's not our problem, it's yours. And they distinguished it down to if the tree was on private property, then it's the private property, even if it's touching their line. Um, and like you say, your contractors don't want to touch it. Not many contractors want to touch it when it's on a wire. Um, and then they said if it's on state or local governments, it's their responsibility. Well, you know, I, you ride up 340 and you look at the wires and it's, it's telephone cable. Um, if we have a, a bad winter or heavy snow, my concern is that south end of the town is um, they're going to be cut off because there's very little cell service in that area. And then you lose your landlines, you know, the people in South River. So that was my question. You know, the polls, not all of them, but a lot of them do set on VDOT right away. Is there any way to pressure them to, to clean up? And I did notice out 340 that um, there's a new cable being put up and they evidently were having difficulties getting that cable up so they were trimming and just dumping it on the right way and leaving it i don't know that they plan to come back or not i haven't asked that question but it just it just seems like they're trying to take advantage of not keeping up their responsibilities so I, I was wondering if there was anything in the contract that beat well, up the Well, there's nothing in the contract that says they have to to trim there on our right of way, okay? And as I said, if if it's if it's a hazard to the roadway, we will take it down, okay? Provided that we don't risk damaging their facility. You know, I will be happy to to. Uh, write a letter to the uh, communications company and express the concerns that are out there, but the, uh, le legally there's nothing in our contract or in our permit that we can force them to do that with. Okay. Any other questions or concerns? No. I just want to thank you. Uh, the bridge, Dean, the bridge on 340 looks great. Um, this last rain, there was no water ponding, so you you got that taken, and I appreciate that. Everything, Thank you. Um, the mowing and all those guys did a wonderful job. So as I, as I said, these fellows get all the credit. I, I get to hear it, but, but they're the ones that make it happen. <laughs> wonderful job. I'm getting a lot of compliments, so thank you. Thank you, Mr. Carter. Sure, thank you. The next report is from the Department of Social Services. Um, John Marks. Good morning, John. Good morning. I'm John Marks, your Director of Social Services. How is everybody today? Thank you. Good, thank you. Uh, I don't plan on taking up too much of your time today, but I did want to cover just a couple of programs that we have right now for the community. 
Uh, the first one is the Pandemic Electronic Benefit Transfer, PEBT, and that's basically a SNAP program that was put in place uh, through the CARES Act, I believe, that all eligible school children who usually get reduced or free lunch are eligible for extra benefits on their SNAP card. The benefit of this program is you don't have to do anything to get it. Um, if you're on the rolls for the school, you're automatically enrolled. You will receive a card, and they should have gotten it probably back in May or June. And the program has been extended, and money is being put on the card as well. So you don't have to do anything extra to get it. It's a benefit that the government has put out. And um, if you have a child enrolled in school, chances are uh, you're enrolled in this program. Now, if anybody who's watching or listening uh, thinks that they may be eligible for it but haven't gotten anything, I encourage them to reach out to our office because we will look into it for you. And uh, I did provide a, a pbtva.com uh, website here, and it should be in your packet, and it's just a little handout, informational um, handout about the program. I do want to bring one thing to everybody's attention, uh, and that is there is a resource that you can use. You can text the word food to 877-877, and it doesn't matter where you are in the Commonwealth of Virginia, you'll get a list of food resources that are in your area uh, that you may be eligible for. It's also in Spanish. You can text the word comida to 877-877 and you will get a list in Spanish of food resources that are in your area. Uh, there's no cost for that text, and it's a really good program, and lets you know that all of the programs that you may be eligible for or could apply for or search for that are in the area that you live in. That's across the Commonwealth. Uh, any questions about the PBT? <coughs> okay. I do want to update you a little bit about the utility program through the CARES Act. Uh, we've gone through two rounds of the program. The first round, uh, we had 17 applications, uh, 14 got approved. In the second round, we had 33 applications, and 32 of them got approved. So that's a total of 50 apps with 46 approved. About $23,900 were spent. It's interesting, the ones that got denied were from Warren County, Ohio. <laughs> so it looks like they just did a little search online and put in Warren County and so then they ended up applying. So um, thanks to uh, the county, uh, we do appreciate that you were able to help out uh, citizens in Warren County, no matter where they lived. Um, there's also a COVID-19 energy assistance program. That's through the Commonwealth. We do have a normal, we have three energy programs that run throughout the year. We have cooling in the summer, we have fuel assistance, and we have crisis that happens in the winter. Um, you have to meet certain requirements to be eligible for those programs. Um, you have to have some of the programs, you have to have a vulnerable uh, citizen in the house, over 60, under the age of six, um, or a medical condition. Um, you also have to meet income limits for the different programs. The COVID-19 Energy Assistance Program is designed for those who don't normally qualify for the energy programs. Let's say your income is over the income limit, for our regular programs, you can apply for this one and you may be eligible for some energy assistance. And that's also through the CARES Act, through the Commonwealth. Uh, so we do encourage anyone who needs some help with their utilities, apply. Uh, you've got nothing to lose by applying. You can call our office, you can come by our office, you can apply online, uh, www.commonhelp.gov. And those applications are free if you need some help filling out your application, please come by the office. I'd be happy to sit down with anybody. Uh, our entire staff would be happy to sit down with anybody and help them fill out the application uh, for any service that we offer. I always tell everybody, you don't know if you're gonna be eligible until you apply. We can't tell you if you're gonna be eligible until you apply. So please apply, please make us do our job. Um, we will happily do it. We'll make sure that anybody who's eligible for a program can get some assistance with it. Our regular energy assistance program is running right now, our crisis assistance. This is a program uh, specifically for equipment related assistance and security deposits. Uh, let's say uh, you have a heating emergency such as you don't have 
heating source in your home. Uh, you have an imminent utility cutoff, uh, inoperable or unsafe equipment. Um, you must be a resident of the locality for which you're applying. Uh, you have to have the responsibility of heating the home. And there are monthly gross income limits for this program. Uh, this program runs from November 1st through March 15th. Uh, it's a quick two-page application. And once again, we'd be more than happy to help anybody complete that application and fill it out. Um, one of the things that we're stressing in our office right now is and I brought this with me, it, it's a feeling that social services is not anybody's favorite place to go unless you work there. Mm -hmm. other, other than that, you don't wake up in the morning going, oh, I get to go to social service today, I'm so excited. You know, it, it takes a lot for people to come through our doors and nobody should ever come through the door to the front window and be told, sorry, I can't help you. Next, um, that's not how we are. That's not how we operate, that's not who we are. And so it, our belief is that you're gonna get something if you come through the door. You're gonna get an application. Uh, you're gonna get a referral to uh, uh, another program in the area. If I don't have a program that can help you, we wanna refer you to maybe there, if there is a program out there. At the very least, you're gonna get somebody who's gonna sit there and listen. Because sometimes that's all you need. You need somebody to listen to you and to maybe guide you in a direction uh, to go. Um, maybe you don't know what you need. Maybe you just know, need you need some help. Um, come in and talk to us, and we'd be happy to um, you know, connect you with any service that we have or any community service that's out there. Um, I wanted to keep my remarks brief because I, I have a special bonus for you today, but if you had any questions for me, I'd be happy to answer them. Just one, if you will, and this is this is available to whether you're renting or whether you own the property. Is that correct? That, that, okay. Yes, sir. All right. I did so want to introduce Chairman, a couple of yes, people sir. to you before you go on, John. Eight seven seven eight seven seven. Thanks for texting. Most school districts are providing meals to enrolled students, including virtual learners. Contact your school system. Reply with full address to get connected to meal sites in your area to open to kids 18 and under. Megan, our data rates may apply. Do you know SNAP provides $150 a month for food? Find out if you qualify, text SNAP at, et cetera. And all that's going to come up at 877-877. Thank you. Yep. So. All right, uh, you may know that the thermal shelter has opened. Uh, our very own Michelle Smeltzer works tirelessly uh, for the community. Um, and she's here today. Also, uh, Pastor Bobby Scott is going to come up and talk to us a little bit about the shelter. I have a football voice, but I'm going to take my mask off anyway. So. <laughs> Uh, so yeah, the thermal shelter uh, has started its fourth season. Um, as many of you know, the, the first three years, we migrated from church to church. We had t uh, 12 churches that would host for a week. Oh, thank you. Uh, 12 churches that would host for a week. Uh, they would move it. We would move all of the cots and everything in. They would set up and uh, they would be there for that week. The church would furnish the meals. and we would give them breakfast and a packed lunch to go. And so we did that for the first three years. Last year, as you guys already know, the, at, at the end of our season, um, we were approached by the board to extend uh, because of COVID and uh, we did. And uh, the board so graciously gave us the 15th Street uh, gym to house because um, then and even now, a lot of the churches that we're hosting um, have older congregations and are really not excited about us coming in on a weekly basis. So we were really going to begin to struggle with hosting. Several churches al were already doing multiple weeks. And uh, so we were kind of at a crossroads, but then uh, the board gave us, and we thank you so much, the um, 
cafeteria at the 15th Street location. And uh, we're here this morning um, just to um, thank uh, the board for the, the opportunity to, to move in there and to have that spot. But also I want to just, if I could, just read a couple of the names that were just instrumental in just helping get that facility. It was, it was not in the best of conditions, but it looks uh, supreme right now. And so we are excited about that. And uh, so we want to list a couple names. Uh, Brandy Rozier, Donna Shackelford, Chuck Harper, uh, Wes Kearns and, and Clark Moat, who just both did a tremendous job of just putting in a lot of time. Monica uh, Schirmerhorn, Daryl Freeman, and then of course all the Parks and Rec staff that has, has just been up there. Um, they also allowed us to put uh, Wi-Fi in the uh, cafeteria. It was about 300 feet of wire we had to run, but we got that put in. And so with that, we have computers. Now they can do job searches, they can do benefits, they can do some things now that we were not able to do when we migrated from church to church. And so that's been a blessing. As we hosted last year, our numbers continued to grow and we were probably 27 at the yeah, max. Yeah. We were 27 at the max. Uh, now that's 18 and older, uh, men or women. Uh, so that's the facility that, that's the program we're running right now. Uh, we started out with five, then this week, or yeah, the first, the Sunday, we started out with five, then we had seven, last night we had 11. And so we'll continue to see that to grow as, as the word gets out in confidence of, um, uh, our guests have a real, um, intricate network and uh, the word gets out that it is a safe place, that it is a good place to go. Uh, the food is great. And so all of that gets out there and we'll continue to see those numbers climb. Uh, we are prepared to do the 20, 25, I think 25 beds. It'd probably go up to 30 or maybe okay. even a little more. So we have, we have extra beds. With the, with the facility the way it is, we can stretch everybody out. The beds are distanced. Uh, cafeteria, we've got tables. They're able to distance there. We've got the cafeteria where we're able to serve um, instead of them just taking the, the food. And so it's just been a tremendous blessing. And we want to thank you guys for just um, making it possible. Um, we appreciate the community just stepping in. Um, it's just everybody's... Um, very comfortable installed a washer and dryer up there in the kitchen we can do clothes they can do their clothes we can do the bed sheets and linens it was costing us a tremendous oh, yeah. amount of money and time and effort every week just to do the laundry and so thank you uh, again for just um, um, helping us out helping us help our guests and um, glad to field any questions that you may have an additional note is, so all the churches have signed up. The ones that we're hosting have signed up to furnish the meals for the week. And so that's been, uh, again, very much as uh, Samantha Barber said, to see the community stepping in and being so involved and, and wanting to be part of the solution instead of part of the problem is, has been, um, it's been heartwarming for us, but it's also been very encouraging. So we thank not only you all for, for the space, but also those churches and organizations that are stepping in furnishing meals. So questions? I can only say we're glad to do it if we mm -hmm. can and we have the ability. Yeah. Um, one question that I have, and then I'll get with you, Mr. Uh, Daly. Um, do you... You, t you say that you can go up to 25, 30, maybe a couple more. If they go beyond that, and I know that that is something that we don't want to think about. Homelessness is a real problem. But if you go beyond that, do you have a secondary place yet that may be able to help? Not no. as if right now we don't. No, we could so. probably, I mean, it would be tight, but we could probably go to 40 in there. Um, with moving out maybe at the tables that we're eating at sure. and the the cause and then moving and kind of moving things I'm sorry moving things around we could probably get do 40 but we don't have a secondary location to go if we are you that. anticipating I mean long-range thinking that's all that we're looking at right now yeah right right now we don't I mean we hope we're not going we to hope not that. I understand but um, yeah right now we don't have you know it's 
it would be hard. Any of none of the churches would be able to host okay. addition that that many people at, at once. So, All right. Yeah. Thank you, Michelle. I appreciate it. Yeah, Dr. Daly. You Yes, sir. Thank you. Just going to make the comment, the fire marshals back there and the building official, David Beam, also figured out how we could do some things over there to make it work. And this is the code and we got to follow the law, but this is how we could do it. They did some of that. And uh, the other thing I would say is when we talk about things like uh, Ron and this program, we have to look at the coordination of them and how we can put them together with social services and United Way to have an umbrella to figure out how we do it so that we can serve everyone the best and not duplicate. Agreed. Thank you. Thank you all you. very much. Thank you very again. Much. We appreciate the uh, help. It's and if I could just add just something really quick. Um, as Dr. Daly said, you can't do this without your partners, and we cannot say enough about our general services partners, uh, Parks and Rec, the uh, Fire and Rescue Department, um, all of our friends in the code office, and everyone who made this happen. I encourage you to come by and take a look at it, and we can show you before and after pictures. They did an amazing amazing job with donated materials and updated um, the space and it looks amazing and um, it's a community effort we're all in this together i thank you the board for helping this to happen as well and um, come by the office anytime i will show you around and uh, i'll give you a quick uh, 10 to 15 minute everything you ever wanted to know about social services so <laughs> thank you thank you Next on our agenda is the report from the Virginia Cooperative Extension Office, Stacy Sw Swan. Swain. Swain, I'm sorry. Yeah, somebody hit me when I say something wrong. <laughs> Comes easy. Good morning. Good morning, Mr. Chairman and board members. Thank you for this opportunity. Um, I am Stacy Swain, so it's a pleasure to meet you. I am the 4-H Youth Development Educator here in Warren County. So I just wanted to take a little bit to go over what our Virginia Cooperative Office is doing currently. Um, you have your report there, so I'm just gonna highlight a few of the things. For our Ag and Natural Resources agents, they've been working um, a lot with spotted lantern flies. I'm sure you all have heard a lot about. So they continue to educate the public on that. Um, it's really big in Winchester right now, so they're getting an influx of reports on that and just trying to get the awareness out there. Um, they also continued with their Graze 300 program, and then they um, are doing, they did some sales over the summer for some of the local farmers, and then um, as long as the wool pool as well. Um, and then many of those agents also helped with um, the local fairs, especially for the livestock shows. For the Family and Consumer Sciences de um, Department, so Karen has been working to offer um, Coping with Money Crunch webinars. Um, so she's had those. Um, that's a virtual thing that's open to anyone. Um, doesn't re require um, to be in a certain county, so those are open. And that's about a two hour webinar that she's still continuing to doing. And then she's also doing her um, Managing Your Money series. And then they have also been working um, just recently, they had the water testing clinics, which everybody kind of worked together. So they were working to get all of that set up. And um, Vanessa has been working to do some virtual uh, webinars on just gardening and for the summer and how to store food and things like that since that's kind of um, been a little influx and people have taken a little more interest in that. As far as the 4-H world, um, so this summer obviously was a little different for us because of COVID, so unfortunately our overnight summer camp was canceled. Um, so we weren't able to get that going um, due to COVID. Hopefully things will change, fingers crossed, that we can have our camp um, in some form or fashion next summer. Um, but thankfully we were able to host our 4-H livestock shows. 
Um, they weren't the traditional shows. We weren't able to have them at the fair like normal, um, but we were able to host those at Virginia Livestock Market. Um, and um, it was still, I think it was very successful given everything that we had to do and everything the kids had to do. Um, for that, we ended up having 13 youth participate. We had over 41 animals that were there. So for given the circumstances of the year, I thought that was very uh, successful and was very happy that those youth were able to still in some fashion um, showcase those animals that they've worked hard to raise. And then we had a great turnout from the community um, as far as the livestock auction, um, it was with those animals that were sold, over $50,000 was raised. And that goes back to those youth um, to pay for those animals and to invest for next year. Um, we had a lot of new buyers come out that were looking for freezer meat to put into their freezer um, just because of all the everything that's going on. So it was good to reach out to those new people and get some more people involved and show them what the youth are doing as they're raising those animals. Um, sometimes they start those projects right now. Uh, many of the youth are getting their market steers for next summer. So just to, for the youth to show um, what they do and how hard they work to raise those animals. And then um, as far as some other programming, just been doing a lot of programs, trying to stay up to date, um, keep those kids engaged as much as possible virtually. We're working hard to get um, some programs going for in the schools, virtual, um, some annual conferences. And then I started a Monarch Butterfly Watch program to just kind of showcase as a virtual program um, the, the process from caterpillar to a chrysalis and then hatching monarchs. Um, so if you haven't had a chance, check out our Warren County 4-H Facebook page. Um, there's some live videos on there that showcase those butterflies hatching out. So that's something um, that I enjoy doing in a program that we do in the schools um, and talk about, but we were able to actually bring that live this year. Um, and actually for the first time, I actually got to see a chrysalis being formed. Um, so that was kind of a unique thing for me and my family to see too, um, and just share that with the public um, of just bringing that life cycle together for everyone. Other than that, right now, we're just kind of gearing up for closing out our 4-H year and our awards banquet, and then just getting ready to start up for a new year um, and hope that we can move forward and engage those kids, whether it's virtual or in person, um, so that they have an opportunity of something else to do in the community. Um, that is all I have. I'd be happy to answer any questions that you have at this time. I don't think so. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Next is the reports from the board members. Um, I think that we probably should, because these couple won't take very long at all, we should be able to just whip through those and then we'll go right to um, the public comment period. Because according to our agenda here, where we changed it, but we can go through our board uh, boards and um, uh, a approval and the unfinished business and get and then we'll get into that lot that hour okay thank you um board members archie do you want to start this morning nothing at this time okay thank you mr scholars um not too much i attended uh, the sheriff's uh, citizen advisory committee that's always um an educational and uh, good meeting Tourism, we our committee met and moving forward on that. CARES Fund, um, we're getting down to the wire on getting all those reviewed and finishing up on that. And it's been a pleasure to work with everyone on that. Um, finished our third session, the budgeting session of the supervisor class, which is always good to be done with the class. And other than that, just our routine stuff. Thank you very much. Um, I had the pleasure of uh, going to the um, Shenandoah Shores board meeting. Uh, it was very good. Uh, everybody everybody was open and honest and it, it sounded like one of our meetings, 
which is sometimes yelling, sometimes screaming, but overall it was a great meeting and I appreciated it. Uh, we had um, uh, emergency management meetings every week, just like normal. Um, and I also uh, attended uh, a meeting with the, the sheriff just to make sure that everything is okay. And that's about it for me. It was a, not necessarily a quiet week because I run all over the place anyway, but I hit the highlights for you. Mrs. Oates. Um, I would just like to inform the community that um, between Front Royal and Warren County, we formed a drug prevention committee, um, drug awareness. We have multiple strategic priorities the committee has set for itself, which includes educating ourselves, increasing public awareness, uh, prevention efforts in our public schools and coordination of resources and that committee is forming um, it's a it's a whole committee which will form subcommittees that will eventually put legs actions to the items that we are addressing uh, in our strategic priorities to help our local community with the drug problems that we are all very aware of and touched by I don't know anybody who hasn't been affected um, so that's one of the areas that I'd like to highlight this morning. Um, and I'd also like to congratulate the new town council members, Joe McFadden, Scott Lloyd, and Lori Cockrell, and um, Mayor-elect Chris Holloway, and just say we look forward to working with you cooperatively. Mr. Carter? I attended um, Linden Volunteer Fire Department. They had a 30th year anniversary celebration. Um, I'd like to wish them all the best for the future. Um, Camping for Hunger starts November 16th. That's been sponsored by uh, WFTR and WZRV. I think this is the 12th year. Uh, they're doing things a little bit differently this year. Normally they would park the bus down at the World Plaza and some of their staff would spend the night overnight. Uh, but because of COVID, they're leaving the bus parked at the station, which is located at 1106 Elm Street. Um, they will still accept uh, dry food, canned goods, but they're also looking for um, monetary donations as well. I think last year they received 12 tons of food and nearly 8,000 uh, in monetary donations. The food and money they collect this year will be donated to CCAP as it's been done in, in, in many of the past years. Uh, I believe they do also accept donations online, and their phone number is 540-635-4121. And I hope everybody had a nice, safe, uh, and happy Halloween this past Saturday. And then we had the election yesterday, so apparently trick-or-treating will continue for some time. And that's all I have. Thank you very much. <clears throat> the uh, interim city uh, county administrator, Mr. Daly. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, flip my page back here. Uh, as you know, we began the initial review of the fire chief applications. We have 17 applications. Uh, 15 are from Virginia. 13 are within an hour of here. So it will be interesting. There are four who are currently serving uh, as a chief, fire and rescue chief somewhere. Uh, three of those are in Virginia. There are five who are serving in a larger uh, jurisdiction as either a deputy chief or a battalion chief. Uh, some of these very large jurisdictions are all divided into battalions and they have uh, more responsibilities for individual wise than what a community our size has for the chief itself. Uh, we have eight with a bachelor's degree. We have two with a master's degree. Uh, we are, have formed most of our committee. I got a couple more people to reach out to and uh, we're anticipating working on those uh, before Thanksgiving if possible to have those interviews. Uh, we have completed the interviews for the sanitary district manager and we're doing some more work. We have rated the applicants and doing some more work on completing those. That should be done, that should be completed this week, hopefully, if not the first of next week. 
Um, we're continuing to work with Valley Health and Anthem, uh, particularly concerned about uh, our employees and have some ideas of what we can do when we get over and we talk about this later with uh, Mr. Farrell. And uh, Rivermont Fire Station, uh, finishing up some last few little things. Uh, not sure we're gonna make the 14th, so we're looking at the 21st to have a, an opening with in coordination with the airport. Uh, we feel safer going with the 21st. And besides, on the 14th, uh, remind you, you will be uh, occupied. We have the advance on the 13th and the 14th. And Mrs. Gromling, our facilitator, has your contact information. And uh, probably she might come back to the chairman and Mrs. Oates who have met with her, but she will be contacting the other three to talk about your priorities and what you would like to do with and achieve at this. And that's all I have right now, sir. Thank you, Mr. Daly. Um, the, our interim county attorney. I have no report. Thank you, sir. Next item is the approval of the accounts. Could I get a motion? Public comment, sir. Say again. Public comment. Period before that. You skip public comment. Do that oh, we're going to do that? Okay. Then we can do the business. My apologies. We're going to do the unfinished business before the public comment period as we reordered the agenda? Yes. 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 So you're right. Well, we can do the <clears throat> approval of the account. Maybe we don't need an agenda next meeting. We just yeah. <laughs> do it on the fly. <laughs> Let's go ahead very quickly and do the approval of the accounts. Uh, could I get a motion for that, please? Just move to approve. I'll second it. Any discussion, concerns? Mrs. Shiraki, could we get a roll call, please? Mr. Fox? Aye. Ms. Cullors? Aye. Mr. Chairman? Aye. Ms. Oates? Aye. Mr. Carter? Yes. Last thing before the um, public presentation or the public comment period is the modification request for conditional use permit 2016-10-3 Gregory and Mary uh, Hudson to add conditional related or to in indoor classes, seminars, and seasonal agricultural activities. Mr. Perry. Yes, thank you, board, uh, for having us here. We originally spoke on this matter on October 20th at the public hearing for this modification to an existing CUP. And since then, we were able to meet with the applicant last week on the 28th. Uh, the applicant, the health department, and uh, building inspections department were able to meet at development review committee, which meets once a month. Um, VDOT was also on the call, Rappanic Electric. So all parties were there and were able to discuss some of the concerns and comments that came up. From that meeting, we have the updated conditions here. Ultimately, the indoor classes that they would like to have had in the home there were just a lot of um, concerns and hurdles that they would have had to done to make it accessible and usable for that. So ultimately they've pulled back on the indoor classes inside of the home and they will be holding them as part of the seasonal activities outdoors, which was originally planned. The indoor classes were only gonna take place if there were um, inclement weather, cooler weather. So. So the classes will coincide with the seasonal activities um, that they will be holding. And they will be constructing an agricultural building that they will be able to utilize again as part of that condition to sell some of the flowers and wreaths that they make or produce that they're producing. And then that can also serve as an accessory to some of these classes. Um, in working with the health department, they do have an opportunity to use portable restrooms, which is approved through the zoning as well. Um, 
for any classes or seminars or activities that they do. And so they're going to be working with the health department to make sure that they are all um, compliant with them. And so I believe the applicant is here if you have any further questions for them. But again, we've sent this to them. They're in agreement with it. We've worked with the health department and everything. So um, we are glad we were able to get that done for you today. Thank you, Mr. Perry. Any questions for Mr. Perry? No, I, I called and got all my questions answered Monday, so I'm, I'm good and I'm ready to make a motion. I move the board of supervisors approve the modification to conditional use permit 20-16-10-03 of Gregory and Mary Hussen, a rural events facility to add classes, seminars, seasonal agricultural activities to the existing existing conditions on the permit second any discussion or concern I had a question when this one came up along with another one last time I don't remember did we not recess the public hearing for this one or did we close the public hearing and wait till later because I'm thinking one of these we recess the public hearing I believe that was Shannon Woods yeah that was Shannon Woods okay I knew it was one of the two I just wanted yes. to clarify thank you Mr. Shiraki, could we get a roll call, please? Mr. Carter? Aye. Ms. Oates? Aye. Mr. Chairman? Aye. Ms. Colors? Aye. Mr. Fox? Aye. Next on our agenda is the um, public comment period it's a total of 60 minutes um, we would like to give everybody at least three minutes the public comment period is an opportunity for citizens to give input on any relevant I issue not the subject of a public hearing and is not intended as a question and answer period the public comment period shall be limited to 60 minutes with a maximum of three minutes for any one speaker. Speakers may only speak once, and speakers will be heard in the order in which they've signed up. Mrs. Shiraki, has anyone signed up? Yes, Mr. Chairman. Laura Lee Cascada? Hi, I'm... There we go. Okay, I'm Laura Lee Cascada at 79 Magnolia Drive. I also have two things to hand you before I get started. Thank you. So first I handed a copy of Dr. James Gillespie, who is the uh, Dean of Humanities at Lord Fairfax Community College. He published a letter to the editor in the Front Royal Examiner yesterday, and I've given you each a copy. He also emailed it to each of you. And secondly, I would like to read the first part of three parts of Front Royal Unite's official statement on the results of ballot question three, and we've divided it up into sections that can fit within three minutes each, so you'll hear two more speakers with the remainder of our statement. The results of question three mark the beginning, not the end, of the debate on Front Royal's Confederate statue. They do not give us a decision, rather they tell us what we knew all along upon founding Front Royal Unites, that the time is ripe for a challenging but crucial conversation about our grim history of racial inequality. And they remind us that what we need right now from our elected officials is for them to do their job, to serve as leaders for all of our residents, especially those most affected by the, the harrowing history and its devastating effects, which linger to this day. The Founding Fathers created a representative democracy rather than a direct democracy for a reason, for elected officials to exercise their wisdom and experience to legislate for the benefit of all citizens, even when those decisions conflict with the majority opinion. Otherwise, why have elected officials like our Board of Supervisors at all? Let us note that this referendum was no consensus and the board has a duty not to turn its back on the almost one quarter of our citizens who are calling for change, many of whom have long been marginalized and ignored. At this moment, it is worth reflecting that our greatest moments 
of progress for justice and equality came not through non-binding referendums, but only after long struggles undertaken by committed groups of citizens, often in the minority, to hold their representatives accountable, from marching in the streets to testifying in Congress, and when all else failed, even litigating in the Supreme Court. Perhaps one might call these trailblazers troublemakers, but we know that had Rosa Parks simply given up her bus seat that fateful day, or had Martin Luther King Jr. wrung his hands instead of marching in the streets of Washington and sharing his dream with the world, that we might not have the Civil Rights Act of 1964, which prohibits discrimination based on race, color, religion, sex, national origin, and now sexual orientation. Had 300 people not gathered at the Seneca Falls Convention to kick off a decades-long crusade for women's right to vote in 1848 and then persisted despite failed congressional proposals, many of us might still be relegated to the kitchen instead of heading to the ballot box with the passage of the 19th Amendment to the Constitution. And after white leaders in the women's suffrage movement refused to incorporate black women into their fight, had Ida B. Wells just accepted her place at the back of the first ever women's suffrage parade, perhaps black women would have been left behind. Mrs. Shiraki, has anyone else signed up? Uh, yes, Mr. Chairman. Kristen Iden. Good morning. Good morning. Kristen Iden, 407 Washington Avenue. Um, Kristen, if you would like, you can pull down your mask because okay. it's a little hard to hear you. Thank you. You don't, you don't have that gem voice. <laughs> I don't. I don't. Thank you. Um, had these historical heroes acquiesced to simple majority vote, we'd have quietly given into the status quo, slavery, disenfranchisement, segregation, time and time again. Without such perseverance <clears throat> by the few to keep the government working for all, democracy of the people, by the people, and for the people will fail. We know from our own harrowing history that Warren County has left its black citizens behind before, being one of the last localities in the entire state to desegregate during massive resistance. When one searches online for massive resistance, Warren County appears at the top of the Wikipedia page, forever cementing our reputation for the world. Across the country, more than 100 Confederate statues have been taken down or moved since the 2015 Charleston Church Massacre. In another 50 years, does Warren County want to be remembered as a champion of civil rights or yet again as the lone handout holdout that refused to recognize the damage inflicted by the institution of slavery after the Civil War. Proponents of the statue remaining in place have attempted to rewrite history to conform to their idyllic fantasies of the Confederacy. However, there is no denying the true history of the Confederate States, which waged their war against the United States for the express purpose of preserving slavery. This disturbing truth resounds in the words of Vice President of the Confederacy, Alexander Stevens, in his cornerstone speech, and I quote, our new government is formed upon exactly the opposite ideas. Its foundations are laid, its cornerstone rests upon the great truth that the Negro is not equal to the white man, that slavery, subordination to the superior race, is his natural and moral condition, end quote. Like hundreds of other Confederate monuments located on public property, such as town squares and courthouse lawns throughout the South, Warren County's statue was erected by the United Daughters of the Confederacy. Despite its assertions that it has stayed quietly in the background, the UDC has a long history of promulgating the dangerous lost cause ideology <clears throat> that downplays slavery as the primary cause of the Civil War leaving more than 42% of Americans believing this false narrative. The UDC's dis disinformation campaign played a major role in thwarting even meager protections for black Americans during Reconstruction. In the early 1900s, the UDC continued to assert white supremacy and terrorize, terrorize black people during the Jim Crow era. Thank you. Mrs. Shiraki, has anyone else signed up? 
Uh, yes, Mr. Chairman. Jerry Myatico? Mr. Chairman, members of the board, county staff, uh, Dr. Daly and Chief may be asked that we come and provide you a brief update on the 2019-2020 SAFER grant program. On October 14th and 15th, the department conducted its standard hiring process with a total of 17 applicants completing that process. As a result, I'm pleased to introduce six new positions to the Department of Fire and Rescue Services, three of which were promoted from part-time to full-time, three of which were hired from outside of the organization. I'm honored to uh, introduce Firefighter EMT Nicholas Bailey, Firefighter EMT Bernard Gotham, Firefighter EMT Edward Hammock, Firefighter EMT Advanced Matthew Hunt, Firefighter EMT Nicholas Lone, and firefighter medic Lisa Wilbanks. These six individuals represent a combination of 82 years of experience in the fire and EMS field. Additionally, five new part-time employees have been selected and will begin work with the department um, over the next month. Uh, we look forward in completing our modified recruit school and begin integrating these six individuals into our full-time uh, staffed positions um, upon the completion of the Rivermont Fire Station. As always, we appreciate the board's continued support towards the Department of Fire and Rescue Services, and I certainly want to single out Chief Maybe, Dr. Daly, and HR Manager Jody Spittler for their um, support in accelerating these higher positions. I know at least for Jody's position, you know, she's already busy, and she made sure that all of this paperwork got done in a timely fashion to meet our needs. Uh, so we certainly appreciate it, and we look forward to you seeing these folks out in the stations. Thank you. Welcome to all of you. Yes. Mm -hmm. Mr. Shiraki, has anyone else signed up? Uh, yes, Mr. Chairman. Avery Harper. Thank you. I'm Avery Harper, 1147 Wetzel Road in Woodstock, Virginia. The UDC, dissatisfied with their success, actually put up a monument to commemorate the KKK in 1926. Thus, despite claims to the contrary, Front Royal statue isn't serving to enlighten anyone on the Confederacy's dark history. It is more than 100 years of existence. It has only furthered, obfuscated the reality that the Civil War was fought for the South's quest to hold up the institution of slavery. Further, our courthouse is our county seat of justice, yet the statue celebrates the so-called patriotism of the Confederacy, whose existence, by its very nature, was an act of treachery through the lettering on its base. The statue supposedly honors veterans, yet its prominence at our courthouse insults the memory of the other veterans honored there who fought for the United States of America while the Confederacy fought against it. Though many of the names on the statue were unlikely slave owners themselves, America's unique outlook is one of aspiration. Countless soldiers fought for the Confederacy not because they owned slaves, but because they supported the institution of chattel slavery hoping one day to be prosperous enough to have their own plantation that would have required slave labor. Importantly, advocates for the statue remaining in place have failed to demonstrate that they would face real harm from its relocation to a more suitable relocation, such as a museum or Confederate graveyard, where they could continue to visit it as often as they desire. Rather, they have relied on the argumententum ad equitem fallacy that the statue has stood at our courthouse for over 100 years and therefore should remain, which is not an argument at all, but the absence of one. Would they say the same of slavery? The costs of the statue remaining on public land, on the other hand, are clear. Every day that it stands, it serves as a perpetual reminder to black folks that they were once considered mere property themselves. Just recently, a Richmond Circuit Court even declared that efforts to stop the removal of the Robert E. Lee Monument, 
they are actually conflict, conflict with our state's current public policy. Recognizing that test, and this is a quote, testimony overwhelmingly established the need of the Southern citizenry to establish a monument to their lost cause and to some degree their whole way of life, including slavery, end quote. Yet Virginia continues to spend up to $9 million in taxpayer dollars maintaining Confederate graves, including hundreds of thousands being funneled directly to the UDC. The danger of the UDC and our government's funding of them are spoken about by Professor Jelaine Schmidt of the University of Virginia, and this is a quote. They created an ideology. Thank you. Mrs. Shiraki, has anyone else signed up? Uh, yes, Mr. Chairman, Samuel Porter. Hey there, good morning. I'm going to finish. Uh, well, my name is Samuel Porter. I'm from 216 Fletcher Street, good old Front Royal, Warren County, Virginia. I'm going to finish or try to read a little fast what they were reading, but I have my own statement. So um, you all have a copy of it, so you're able to sort of review it on your own time. So. We now turn to the present day Warren County to address the false notion that racism like slavery is a relic of our past. Take for example the case of former Warren County Warren Page NAACP President Suetta Freeman who even after surmounting being locked out of schooling by re massive resistance at Warren County High in 1958, went on to graduate here and embark on a career in auditing, yet had to commute for decades to Northern Virginia because she was unable to secure fair and equal employment in Front Royal. How about her experience illustrates the racial inequality that this is an endemic um, nationally. On average, black people make up only 62% of white people's salary. Or this year when a truck drove past the home of a prominent member of our black community and it shouted, white power. Or this summer when a mixed race child accidentally dropped a hand wipe at Applebee's and her mother found it returned to their car with the writing, you asked me for this wipe, then left it saying, Mm -hmm. right where that little peckerhead half-breed dropped it on so everyone else could step on it. Though I'm sure your home is filthy and cluttered, we try to keep our, our town clean. This is the kind of things that we go on here. So I'm actually going to quit reading this because I don't have enough time to read that and what I have to say. So Warren County, Virginia, y'all won the Stuck Up in the Past Award with this referendum and the results. And I personally wouldn't be too excited about that. Approximately 20,683 people voted yesterday for this question. And I just want you to remember that number. You can jot it down if you want to again. So far, the results unofficial, 20,683. White people make up about 90.5% of the population here. Black people make up about 5%. So let's, with the numbers that you should, so you should have gotten a result of about 15,000 or 18,718 if we're if if it comes down to like a really race issue which I think it is um, and then you should have gotten about a thousand people the black population if they are voting about a thousand should have voted you know uh, to remove it or relocate the final if you break it down by percentages about 15,000 folks said to remove it 4,879 said to keep it. Now I know that all 4,879 aren't black people because we just don't have that many here. But I'm, major I'm sure a majority of them voted to relocate it with, with among their allies. So it's really awesome to me. It shows that the black people here in our county want it to be relocated. And that's what we've been doing this whole time. You wanted the results and you got it. So let's go a little bit further. I, I'm a black man. I'll let everybody in here know it. Um, we expected Red Warren County to vote this way because it was turned into a Republican Democrat thing and it never had to be that way. Um, one more thing, North River, South River, and Happy Creek, we know what make up those districts, majority of the black population. Bentonville and Browntown do not. Go look at the numbers and let's make sure that when we vote and how we move forward, that we're just being sure on what we're voting for. The black people want it relocated, and the white people can't tell us what to do. Mr. Shiraki, has anyone else signed up? Yes, Mr. Chairman, Tim Radigan. Tim Radigan, 6079 Stonewall Jackson Highway. I'd like to clarify one thing real quick. Do we not live 
in a constitutional republic, I mean, that's what I was taught in school. I'm sure our education has been watered down considerably since I spent the better part of last week watching some documentaries on the untold history of America and a very inspiring and beautifully done history of Africa and their hidden cities that they did. I mean, they had wonderful technology. They were expert builders. The list goes on and on and on. But I thought that we lived in a constitutional republic. I'd like to mention something else that is very seldom mentioned in this debate. That monument stands on a Civil War battlefield. That monument stands on the blood-soaked soil of both Southern and Union soldiers. In fact, the vast majority of this town stands on the Civil War battlefield. Street urban fighting from street to street. And a good portion of it happened right on the courthouse lawn. It's important for us to remember that. It is also important to remember that our republic has lasted for over 200 years. Our constitutional republic has stood for over 200 years. And it has worked well. The citizens have voted. And I would hope that the Board of Supervisors would honor the votes that was taken. A young lady handed me a napkin at the beginning of your term. And I have spoken about that napkin, and I have that napkin at home. We have a new board. Another thing I would like to mention very, very quickly is that we are a united people. Instead of battling about a monument, we should be encouraging our our educational system to look over the curriculum. And instead of teaching a watered down curriculum, that should teach us the entire truth. Because that's what we're looking at right now. Okay? Our history may be dirty, it may be ugly, but it needs to stand so that we teach future generations this is not what to do. We handle things through diplomacy. I thank you for your time. Mrs. Shiraki, has anyone else signed up? No one else has signed up, Mr. Chairman. Is there anyone in the audience that would like to speak? I don't have a problem with that. You're speaking. Um, again, my name is Samuel Porter, 216 Fletcher Street, good old Front Row, Virginia, Warren County. Um, and I just want to say with Mr. Well, Robert's rules, sorry. I agree that we, uh, we need to focus on educating our children better and doing the right thing there. I think that some of our teachers also need a little bit of help with maybe with their salaries, I'm not sure. Um, also with the sheriffs that we do have, um, I appreciate them and I'm very thankful that they support our county. My grandmother wakes up at 3.30 every morning to make it down to the city to go to work and if she ever needed a problem that early um, in the morning, I would hope that our sheriffs, and I think they would, go and help her and assist her. So I'm thankful for them. I think that in the in the notes, I seen that they were trying to add 12 new officers or one intelligence and then 10 patrol. And I just really, really want you all to know that I support sheriffs, but I want to support the ones that we already have on the force. And I know that some of them are able to get things like food stamps and able to get things like Habitat homes. Why don't we increase the salaries of the ones that we already have? And instead of maybe adding 10, add three and then support the others that we already do have because it's hard to be them. They do have hard jobs. Let's just make sure when we move forward with these deputies, if we do have to add some, we, we pay attention. One of the parts of the premises 
responses to the argument was that our town or our population has increased 25%, but per the census, that's just incorrect. It's about five, or well, maybe 7% between 2010 to 2019. So if we're basing that increase off of the premise that our population has grown, it would be false. And so we would need to go back to the drawing board to make sure we find some premises that would that would allow us to do that increase. Because right now, based off of the report in y'all's agenda that you can find online, um, or what, uh, what was submitted to you all, 25% increase is just not the thing. And so that's in y'all's record, and I just hope that we maybe fix that before we act on it. Is there anyone else in, that would like to speak? Is there anyone in the audience who would like to speak? Final call. The public comment period is now closed. Lost my agenda. The public hearing. Okay, should we? Do we want to take a break for five or ten minutes? Uh, do we need a bio break at all? I do. I need one minute. All yeah, right. Yes, sir. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Five minute break, please. Meeting is back in session. Thanks everyone for the indulgence of a few minutes. Uh, everybody needs a bio break for every once in a while. Next item on our agenda is the consent. Are there any items to be pulled for further discussion? So I think in your amended agenda, you substituted the item six, request for resolution to adopt the resolution. And in lieu of that, instead, schedule uh, adopted the item to request the public hearing which will fit we had I, a i think we should just proceed with the consent agenda because if we're not going to pull anything off then this is an easy yeah yeah well, we we've, we've got individuals here for shannon woods that was my my thought I, the only thing that i mean shannon woods is part of the public hearing correct yes First thing, uh, consent agenda normally takes, unless we're talking about anything else, normally takes just a few minutes. Um, they've been very, very patient. Do you mind if we go ahead and do that? Yeah, I make a motion that we uh, that we accept the consent agenda with the um, omission of item number six as per our agenda. So I make a motion that we pass that. I'll second. And the addition of number five on your amendment, sir. Yeah, I think. Yeah. Just or to make it clear. One or the other. I think maybe just uh, accept it as presented because it is as presented now. So okay. It's been amended. So okay. I'm sorry, as presented. Okay. Archie. Second. <laughs> Any additional questions or concerns? Can we get a roll call, please, Mr. Rocky? Mr. Fox, I do. Ms. Colors, I, I have a question. Are we pulling number six? You said with yeah. the omission. It's all okay. Yeah. Aye. Mr. Chairman. Yes. Ms. Oates. Aye. Mr. Carter. Yes. Next on our agenda is the public hearing. Uh, the ordinance to establish the Shannon Wood Sanitary District, Mike Berry. And I do have Mr. Berry on the phone in case the board has any questions, but there are representatives from Shannon Woods in the audience as well if they have any questions about that too. Okay, thank you. Would uh, the owners like to come forward and talk to us? Chris Powell, Shannon Woods, 568. This time I brought the book. <laughs> I came <prepared> this time. 
Uh, did the board receive our response to the letter of complaint? Has everybody had time to go over it? Yes. Yes, and I talked to Mr. Barry in depth on Monday as well. Okay. Um, would you like me to review it or specific questions about it? I have no questions. I have no additional questions. No. Okay. Ready. Yeah, we're, yep, ready for, we're ready for a motion. The Board of Supervisors approved the attached ordinance to establish the Shannon Woods Sanitary District as identified on the attached map. And, and open the public hearing. And um, it closed oh, the public hearing. Oh, sorry. You yeah. jumped the gun trying to get you out of here. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So we recessed the public hearing, so we need to close the public hearing. So you hearing need to first. close the public hearing and then make okay. your motion. You do, and, and having interrupted you, I also had a suggested change to the ordinance, and, and at the end, I think it would be good to put, and as described in Exhibit A, and then have Exhibit A be this map. And the reason for that is that five years' time, whatever, someone goes looking for this ordinance, they'll have the full ordinance that describes the exact meets and bounds of the subdivision, which I think is a, or of the, san, of the um, sanitary district, which I think is a better practice. Just put Exhibit A on I'm this. fine. Yep. So, you know, the motion would be, as you read, and modify the ordinance to add and as described in Exhibit A. And access? And as described in Exhibit A. Okay. We still should run through. Um, we need to end the public hearing. We need to end the public we hearing. We need to close it, yeah. Is there anyone, Mrs. Mounts, that has signed up for the public hearing? No. Is there anyone else that would like to speak? Is there anyone in the audience who would like to speak? Final call. The public hearing is now closed. What is the pleasure of the board? Okay. I move the Board of Supervisors approve the attached ordinance to establish the Salmon Wood Sanitary District as identified and described in Exhibit A. Second. Any additional discussion or concerns? Mrs. Shiraki, could we get a roll call, please? Mr. Carter. Aye. Ms. Oates. Aye. Mr. Chairman. Aye. Ms. Colors. Aye. Mr. Fox. Aye. Thank you all for coming. The uh, next item on our agenda is the good request for the memorandum of agreement with Chester Gap Volunteer Fire Department. Mr. Daly. Thank you, Mr. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. We've been uh, talking with Chester Gap Volunteer Fire Company and Rappahannock County about the fact that as a result of COVID, they lost some of their volunteers who were unable to remain on duty so they have been providing a paid person and that person has been paid in a reimbursement by Rappahannock County for the first quarter of April through July, or June 30th. <coughs> and therefore it was proposed that we begin funding this jointly and currently the proposal from Rappahannock was that we would each fund this at $5,000 per month. And so we're requesting your approval of this agreement, which provides $60,000. And part of this cost will come from the CARES Act and part of it will not because of the December deadline is the reason. And the remaining will come from the residual over here, which will show after bit when Mr. Lieutenant Farrell comes in. Uh, but we're requesting your approval on this. We've talked about expanding this and we will talk Rappahannock at that time did not indicated they did not want to expand it first. They wanted to try this. And so we're proposing that we do the one person for the $5,000 at this time. And we may come back when they're ready to talk about expanding it. And they will be following our protocol procedures when they're in Warren County. And that may require, as we look at it, that may require that we come back and talk about a second position. So we're prepared to talk about that as it comes. Thank you, Mr. Daly. 
do we have uh, a motion on this? You're going to open it up for. Um, it's not a public hearing. Oh, this isn't a public. No. Um, so I have it. So you're you're suggesting I can see on here the proposed funding is ten thousand per month, but that was going to be for two people, or that is, is divided between the two jurisdictions. It's okay. one position. Okay. So we're just approving one. Person. We're approving five thousand dollars per month. Okay. That will be reimbursed to, sure to the company because that it says ten thousand per ten thousand total cost. Yeah. Okay. And on the MOA. It talks about 45,000 mm -hmm. from October to June 21. Because it's 45,000 from October to June 30th. Right. And then it's 15,000 for the July through okay. October, September 30th period. Okay. And the only other question I have too, so the total between the two jurisdictions is 120,000 for one man. Yes, sir. For a 24 hour seven position. 24 hour seven position. Okay. Right. So it's a, they're, they're using, uh, okay. they're using part time personnel. They're not hiring any permanent okay. personnel at this time. So it's a one full time position, not one full man. I got you. <laughs> right. What they're, what they're doing, they, I've, I've been working with them on this. And what they've been doing is they lost almost their entire crew. Right now, Chief Brown is the main volunteer with other volunteers as they can but they have no ems crew they've they've got people still able and we've got a member here he can correct me if i'm wrong that are still able to fight fire but when you get to the um emergency medical part is where the problem is he's lost almost his entire staff so he's what he's been doing is supplementing with part-time people, which uh, he has been currently paying out of their, um, their, their fundraising and, and that kind of thing out of their own pocketbook virtually. So um, we got together on the thought if um, Rappahannock would pay, and I gave you a list of numbers to show the amount of calls. Um, Dr. Daly and I met with um, their administrator and their um, supervisor as well and they run what is it like 57 percent of their calls mm -hmm. are run in one county and for the month of october you can see they had um, a total of rappahannock calls uh, were 16 warren county calls were 33 and they also run into falk here and they had two there so they're running the majority of their calls with us and they felt like that you know we should help supplement them and i think we all agreed on that i i also included to you two letters um, from the representatives of uh, point of woods and lakefront royal and one the current way that they are doing it they're using part-time people so they don't have to pay benefits and which helps stretch their budget but one person can't run a call so if they don't have a volunteer person and right now um i think chief brown practically lives at the fire department to help run he can drive but one person can't run a call by themselves so the protocol that once we start supplementing them the uh, warren county fire and rescue is that they that they what they call staff and they call in each day and say we're staffed and then our dispatch system knows that they have enough people there that they go out as a first responder is and i don't want to mistake that and um if there's only one person there they're not going to be able to fulfill warren county's protocols on a two person to run these calls so and he wants to make sure that they do that um but at the same time you know he can't guarantee he maybe has a doctor's appointment or a family emergency or even health where he's not capable of being there because he gets covid quarantined one person is you know basically we're paying them to sit there and not be able to run a call whereas if we were to pick up the obligation of what they're supplying to warren county and say we'll give 
during this COVID, then this is what people need to understand. We're not saying this is going to be a forever more. This is to get us through this COVID period until everybody can get back and feel comfortable running these calls and the volunteer forces back. They haven't quit the system. They're just not able to run the calls because they don't want to take the chance of bringing a COVID back to their families. So if we were able to supplement them a 24 hour person instead of a 12 hour, it would give them that two person crew to be able to fulfill their commitment of staffing. So, you know, that's the part in here where we're basically saying, yes, we agree to the 5,000, but we may need to come back and look at the fact that we need to supplement a little more to give them what they need to 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 meet these protocols is this money coming from cares act part of it and okay. we'll we'll go through that on your chart okay in a little bit. i was it, thinking it, that that's it's what no it's no that. new money out of your general fund okay as it out of your current budget funds. okay yeah. and the fact um, is these numbers are going to go up because right now they're not considered staff so they're not they're they're being punched out obviously they ran 33 calls and 13 of which were ems calls um, but the fact is once they are considered staff those numbers are going to go up because where they may not get punched out for every call that's in their call district now because they're assumed not staffed once they say they're staffed those calls yeah, are going to pick up. Yep. Well, I will move at the Warren County. Wait, wait. I've got one more question. Oh, okay. Do we have that person ready to go? Yeah, please. Person, sir. It's, it's yeah, person. Multiple All persons. individual one. Now, okay, but I mean, do I think we they have, have people a group that are of ten? Is what they have now. Of, I know of, they have a group of ten. I, I understand that. But so we're, we're just we're talking money about for the per, the the position. Yeah, do we have person. a yes, ma'am? Um, right. I'm Kevin Williams with Chesapeake Fire Department. Chief Brown couldn't be here this morning. We have a EMS inspection, and as Mr. Colors talks, he's one of our ones that are staffing during the day and everything while our volunteers are working. Um, we currently have this in place right now. Um, what we're asking is it's not for a person, it's for the position, right. basically. And one thing I wanted to point out real quick as far as the 33 calls for Warren County, um, it was 13 fire and 20 EMS. Okay. is what we had and that's not staffed so when this mou goes in place we will be staffed so like Ms. color said that number would go up so not being staffed as far as calling in staff with warren county um, because we haven't been able to do that um, because rappahannock might as well say has been putting the money for it yeah uh, we're getting a lot of they have. Uh, ridicule if you want to say it on that side of the mountain as far as, oh, you always in Warren County, you always in Warren County, we're paying for you to go into Warren County. So that's really how this came about as far as uh, working with Ms. Colors and coming to the board saying, hey, what can we do together? Because 60, sometimes 75% of our time is being spent on this side of the mountain. And our first due is larger on this side of the, the mountain than what we have in Rappahannock County. Um, our first due is including the 4-H Center, the Customs Center, and all that from Rappahannock County to Warren County line. Um, in Rappahannock County, we go maybe three miles down the road and, and off to the left and right to there. Um, so, so like I was saying, it was out of those 33 calls, 20 of them were EMS and 13 were fire. Um, right now with that one person and trying to do a schedule with the volunteers we still have. So Chief Brown is not doing everything because a lot of people are working a lot of our volunteers that were emts are still restricted from work um, that are career or still being restricted to where we cannot run ems calls um, so as miss colors was talking as far as like the 24-hour person um, with the majority of our calls being spent in warren county uh, what we were trying to decide as far as to make both sides of the county um, equal as far as where we're coming to the table and we're talking about paying half now um, with the 12 hour person we would look at it as Brad panic would be paying for the 12 hour person and Warren would be paying for the 24 hour person it means 60 to 75 percent of our calls are over here uh, we currently have a pool of 10 to 12 people um, that are signed up to work part-time um, they all have their certifications some are just EMTs um, 
probably 90% of them are firefighter EMTs. So they can cross staff if, if we need to during the daytime. Um, but their main goal is on the ambulance providing EMS care and everything. Um, I have, I and I think if we actually, if MOU goes in place and we staff, um, you're really gonna see these numbers go up if we're used in the staff and policy like we should be. I have one final question. Yes, sir. Um, I, I understand that you've got the people to do the work and you're doing it now. How many calls have you missed because you didn't, you weren't able to meet the need, so to speak? So right now, um, as Ms. Culler stated, uh, Chief Brown is pulling a lot of the load as far as the driver during the daytime for this person. Uh, right now, um, we've been responding to with this in place. We have not missed any calls without having a volunteer there to drive for them. Uh, since this went in place in uh, end of March, 1st of April, I believe, um, it's been a 100% response rate. Um, before that, we were still averaging 95 to 100% to response rate, but then all of a sudden we lost those EMTs, and Chief Brown, being the leader he is, he basically said, I've got to do something. Our choice up there, if we didn't enact something, was either we were going to have to turn in our EMS license to the state, or we try to put a program like this in place. And he took it, he ran with it, um, made it work, and we reached out to Rappahannock, because we're Rappahannock County, and that's where we were getting a lot of kickback because we were spending more time on this side of the, of the mountain as far as the percentage of calls and everything. Uh, and everything. So that's how all of it came about as far as approaching Warren County as well. Thank you, you so, answered my question. Yes, sir. Any additional questions from the board? Do we have a motion? I will move the Warren County Board of Supervisors approve the proposed agreement with Chester Gap Volunteer Fire Department. Second. Second. Uh, any additional questions or concerns? Mrs. Shiraki, could we get a roll call, please? Mr. Fox. Aye. Ms. Cullors. Aye. Mr. Chairman. Aye. Ms. Oates. Aye. Mr. Carter. Aye. Next on our agenda is the request for 12 additional deputy positions for Warren County Sheriff's Office. Mr. Butler, or Sh Sheriff Butler. This has been a very a strange way to bring forth asking for people. Um, we want, we'd love to have 12 people. I'm not asking for 12 people today. We're gonna need it in the next five years. But what I want to do is, like I have been trying to do with everything, is take a small bite out of moving forward. We are re trying to rely heavily on part-time employees, but we know we don't pay our part-time employees a good enough salary, and we have nothing to offer to them. Um, we're working towards that. Uh, our deputies don't make it parity with Front Royal. I'm working towards that. I've already presented it to... Uh, many of you um, but as COVID has hit the epidemic on overdoses uh, just being short if one person uh, comes in contact with a positive individual that really probably puts two people out in my department um, we're already short-staffed difference between us and a lot of other departments is I can hire someone tomorrow to go do a certain job. I can't do that in law enforcement. I have to train them. So if I hire someone new, it's gonna take them a year and a half to hit the street and be effective. A year and a half. And we know that we're already behind the ball. So as I, I looked at the budget all day yesterday, I've actually damn near completed uh, 2021's budget. Um, I will be requesting three additional positions next year, one being an ACO, because our calls have gone up. And I appreciate Mr. Porter um, saying our deputies need more money because they damn sure deserve more. Um, and 25% we have, if you look back, it's actually a little bit more, but I'm not going to get into the details on that. It, does, it is added into my how I'm looking at it. Actually, when I see my entire department get affected, 
Um, and we've been way ahead. You have to look at our deputies. This isn't like a normal large agency. Every single deputy from the sheriff down to the lowest ranking person, dispatcher communications officer, doesn't have just one job. They have two and three. So if they're sitting there and they've just worked a 12 hour shift, they have a canine that they also work, and then they get a SWAT or attack team call out. We're, we're running, we're running on empty. So you throw COVID into it, and we're running on even. It's almost unsafe. It's almost a liability for myself and the county. So I had to look at it, and I don't believe in being top heavy. I didn't run. I ran that I would not be top heavy. Uh, we have functioned without a captain since May and we have it worked out we have a management plan that's standard across the country of one in five it's working extremely effective I would like to right now because I have it in the budget a crime analyst and take that captain and make that a sergeant's position that way that sergeant can be effective not only in the field but in the administrative side, just all the way across the board. This will not increase my budget at all. It's in my budget. I'll probably save money by doing this. Next year in my budget, I will request for three additional personnel. I'm not going to go into details on all the different reasons why I need those positions. I will tell you if you look across the board, we could put you we could use one or two individuals in every section I have we have about 14 or 15 part-time employees and I'm trying to increase that as well At mr. Daly myself we well we've all talked I'm trying to figure any way possible to take some of the pressure off of my guys and their families and that's why I'm here so yeah I would love to have 12 people I also know it's not feasible all right do I need four? Yeah, I do. I need them bad. But it, let's be realistic. We can't get a lateral position in here with the money we pay. And then it's going to take, we're going to have to get 30 applicants to find the one that's going to take that. It, it, it's just, it's amazing. But I have all the faith in the world in you all. I know you all will find a way to pay our deputies more money, and that'll help us in the long run. I believe in you. So that what I'm asking, really what I'm asking today, let me hire a crime analyst position, because that's going to make us more effective and efficient. Take my captain's position, move it to a sergeant, and we'll discuss the other positions when we discuss budget. If. Questions? Oh, Mr. Chairman, uh, for the board's information, if he does this within his existing budget and he's not asking for additional funding, then he can do this himself. Right. I right. was going to ask. We don't need to approve So the board, board does not need to approve it. And, and I understand that. Yeah. <laughs> but if you want to throw me some extra positions, too, I'm all for that as well. No. <laughs> but uh, that's I think what we I need to review. I, the, I agree. The, before, I, I'm yep. hesitant because I don't understand where your gaps and weaknesses are, and I'd like to understand that. And, you know, we can sit down or we can do charts or you can show us where you have limitations, and then we can see how, how they fill those gaps, and you can describe how to fill those gaps. But just so the public understands and we understand what your requirements are. And I agree, I agree with that. Yeah. Um, and I've mentioned to many of y'all, um, and person for the last 11 months both on salary and personnel um, and that's where I really think if I put it in the budget request through the budget when we actually sit down with the budget I can explain to you better and it gives us all time to catch our breath from COVID and everything else uh, but I adding a position of a crime analyst my my understanding was I do need to ask you because it's a full-time position it's that's not, why no I'm, additional money no, no additional money yeah, no it's in my it's in my budget Good. it went too yeah. long ago we did increase the dispatch people by like 30,000 <clears> at that time too I think you also asked for two additional dispatchers which Correct. I think we ta tabled that didn't we no we we ta we got the two dispatchers but we tabled the uh, raising the dispatchers money 
So you got already got two more. Yeah, okay. and I appreciate it, and it's working out. But like I said, we're still working on filling those two gaps. So explain this crime analyst to me. Is this going to be a deputized deputy? No, ma'am. It'll be a civilian just... position. A civilian position, but the average good crime analyst it has either a master's degree or a doctorate. I'm also hoping with these positions to look for grants. As you know, I have an amazing grant writer um, to actually supplement the salaries. If you look at the COPS hiring program, a lot of times with the opiates, um, we can move that forward, you know, through grants that way, and that's what we're looking at. Um, getting accredited would have helped, and we're working. We're about 60% of the way to being accredited, so we're, we're working diligent that way, and that's how it's going to help. But we're really hoping being accredited, and with all the new um, requirements being brought forward with SROs and so forth, tell you the truth. We don't have the positions to, or the positions to support sending individuals to training. That's one of the aspects to it. And there's a lot of new training requirements coming down the pipe that we need to enhance. But we'll dis we can discuss that at a later date. I just need those. What I'm really here for is to let you know I am requesting. I already know we, we don't. It's a little scary right now. But we're about two months before we go into budget. And that's why I prepared it yesterday, so I could stand up in front of you and know my numbers pretty well. And those two positions are clearly in my budget that I have already this year. And I will put the others, start putting the others in my budget across the next few years. So, uh, Dr. Daly or uh, Jason, do we need to vote on him? Um, you don't need to take any action. Not if he stays within this existing yeah, if budget. If he needs anybody's so. approval. That's also, I thought, I really thought I had to get the crime analyst position approved by you all because I am adding that position. But it, I do have the money in my budget to pay for. Go forth, prosper, awesome. sir. Thank you all very much. They'll be there and next it year will too. impact next year's budget coming up. It will impact next year's budget. But really, it really won't, won't be adding to it. It will just be staying there. And actually by reducing the captain's position, suspending it for now, um, we should be able to pay for both the analyst and the sergeant's position because that's another one that if you, I don't have that sergeant's position, um, but it's in the budget. That captain, I can make a sergeant. I have the clear in the clerical budget to pay for it all. So you're doing that by promotion? Correct. So the Which, two dispatch people that we approved, mm -hmm. that was 100000 I think you absorbed that in this year's budget. Yes, sir. But that's going to come back next year, too. Yes, sir. So just, you know, like I said, I, I think that's the appropriate time to be discussing that with you and all the other departments because we don't know what's going to happen with COVID. It's going to bounce back. I agree you know, I think right now, last I saw, our sales tax increased, but I think our food taxes decreased or remain flat. So if we get another wave of this stuff, we may see less revenues, too. And, again, I understand your need, but there's a lot of needs. Not enough. Oh, I know that, sir. I, I truly but do understand that. I appreciate you coming and, and giving us a heads up and and uh, prepare us for that. And like I said, when you come for the budget presentation, there'll be more information, and we'll see uh, the complete picture and not just your place Correct. and all. I mean, I don't know what the schools are going to want. I don't know what the other departments and the whole thing. So and that's why we're starting to process eh, pretty much now, and we hit it hard in January. So I do appreciate you coming before us, though. Well, I've spoke with Mr. Daly on great lengths. Um, I'm a huge fan of the part-time employee. And if you look at it right now, we're sitting with about 14 to 15 employees that are part-time. Um, difference with the part-time employees, there's no skin in the game. We're not, I mean, we can make the money at 84 lumber lows or whatever, the same amount of money, but they still have to require, both of them have to require the same standards and, and certifications because they're professional law enforcement officers. Um, so it makes it very difficult to hire an individual at those rates. Um, I mean, Ferguson, you can go to Ferguson more with no experience and start out at almost 20 an hour. So that, that's what we're coming up against. I'm all for the SROs. I actually believe we could supplement a lot of our holes with part-time employees, like in the SRO, because they work a part-time schedule in a sense anyway. 
Um, summer times, they're not there. We put them on patrol to do additional patrolling and so forth. Yeah. Um, so coming to you, I would have came earlier with this, but no one knew if the schools were even going to open. So then I would have had 10 employees. I would rather have waited and run short like we did than to lay 10 employees off. So that's why I waited till now. And I think we're functioning, but we are running pretty tired. But thank you very much, and I appreciate it. Thank, thank you, you, Sheriff Butler. And the sheriff will be back next week uh, for the work session along with fire and rescue. We'll have okay. the sheriff's office and the fire and rescue both. Next is uh, the request for the increased spending authorization in order to respond to COVID-19. Uh, Mr. Daly and, and Rick. Good morning, Mr. Chairman, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, as far as the increase in spending goes, uh, Ms. Logan will report to you that we are nearing half a million dollars in uh, FEMA B expenditures. And just like in the past, uh, we think it's time to bump up uh, the pot, if you will, to cover that. Uh, we are recommending a pen and ink change here to appropriate an additional half million for a total maximum of one million dollars uh, to go towards the FEMA B expenditures. And Dr. Daly will explain to you uh, in a bit when I'm done how we're going to do that essentially at, uh, I don't want to say no cost to the county, uh, but reimbursing the county. So the proposed motion would be 500,000 instead of the 250 and 1 million instead of the 750. With the jury, uh, jury trials resuming in school, uh, we think we're gonna eat up quite a bit of that with PPE just for those two places. And I might mention the other piece of that that we are looking at, that we discussed last week, was the air circulators and yeah. putting air circulators in our facilities. Now, we're, we're going from um, five to a million, right? Yes, sir. Okay, in, in our um, motion, it's listed at 750. Right. We but in your amended agenda, agenda yeah. you changed that to a thousand, to a million, rather. Yeah. Making sure we cover all the bases. Any additional questions? We'll, uh, I'm open for a motion. Are we going to hear how this has freed us before we do the motion? Freed us? Well, he said no cost to the county, so. Well, so this is it, your FEMA B yeah. money. Okay. This is the money that you we are going to request reimbursement from, uh, which we'll talk about in the chart over there, but that's this over here at the end where we've been collecting our expenditures for each of the different departments and our activities includes uh, social services, the schools and the county, the library and Northwestern Community Services. And Taryn's been, uh, Mrs. Logan has been accumulating that and reporting to you each month as that goes up and we're right at pushing that half million and looking at what we got to do reopening for jury trials and then also looking that um, we want to do these air circulators in our buildings and those two we believe will push us up closer to we rick and i had talked about uh, 750 and the chairman said it might look better if we just went to the million and that money's over here under reimbursement not spent until we need it and that's right we don't spend it we only spend it. it's an authorization but we only spend it when we need and that money um, it may be reimbursed in six months it may be reimbursed in a year it may be reimbursed in four years you know they're just reimbursing in September and October they reimbursed expenditures from the hurricanes in 2016 so it may be 2024 and if you look at the bottom down here it says we will have uh, up to one million dollars in expenditures and there's the potential 
of reimbursement by FEMA up to 750000 But they will go through there and they may say items 1 through 10 are good, item 12 is not. And they may say you get $705,000 or six hundred and twenty. So is the contingency that's listed here for the million, the contingency of uh, in the event that FEMA yes. doesn't want to pay our, you so, know, for whatever reason, they don't have the funds to, to reimburse us? Yeah, and again, uh, looking there, the state sometimes reimburses 25% of these things. Right. And they may or may not decide to do that. We know we're going to have an expenditure of 50000 and we may have as much as a million that would be on us. And if we do what we're doing now, if your CARES Act money, down here you have under public safety, you have the money that's been in expenditures that have been incurred by the county for sheriff's office and EMS, fire and EMS over there. And that money then becomes, if you cover that up, that is now your general fund money. You're reimbursing your expenditures. And when that occurs, then there's this two million over here that was here for public safety, comes over here. And of it, we are using the antennas, which you've already approved, and the courthouse, and then the acknowledgement pay that we're going to talk about on the 17th. The Lord Fairfax said training, retraining program that we will have, we don't have a contract yet for you to review and look at. And we moved the audit expenditures from CARES over here because we don't know when we're gonna do the audit. So we wanna close out CARES December 31 and be done, and then close it up and then we can have it total. And then Chester Gap, which we just talked about. And then there's this FEMA B down here of one million and that comes over here to protect you against this side which is what you're doing FEMA B and you may get it all reimbursed which is good then then you've got seven then you're 750 or even 700 or 950 to the good but we can't count on that so we're not counting on that we're assuming that you're gonna to have to pay this. So we're putting it over here and it comes down here. And then the remainder right above it is the 635. That's the difference between the 2165 and what you have designated as expenditures here. And so that ends up going back into your general fund as a reserve and that can be used for something like if we develop a broadband plan. We can use it for that. Or you can just let it be in there and be your protection against as, uh, the meals tax. You know, they're coming back. We're within, um, we're under 5% difference between now and last year. But we still got a little crack. We, before, back in April, we were 40% difference. But now we're down to five. That's good. So we're, we look at this next month. We may very well, when we see October and November, we may very well close that gap and be back to where we were a year ago. But that means we're where we were a year ago rather than new. <laughs> but we look like we're closing that. And this may help to pay for that, to support it, is what it would do. It would be in there as your budget reserve because it goes back to your cash balance. So it's part of your reserve. And if the sales or the <laughs> meals tax, as an example, is below the budget estimate, and this is above, you're still good. So that's the purpose of the million dollars. And you can, the lieutenant will go through this in a minute here. We can do the first item being the million. Do we have a motion? Any questions? Well, my, I, the reason I ask is that it just worries me going into looking at doing the compensation payments to, you know, are we hitting our general fund a little hard and we could always come back for another 250. That was my concern. Yeah, you're you're going to have this to reserve. We want to get, um, 
the 250 now so that we can do these air circulators as soon as we can. Quite frankly, we need them anyway. Uh, and we can put them in these buildings and get them underway. And by the time uh, that you by the time that you get that those into okay. well, I just wanted to make sure we weren't hitting that general fund. I don't think that we are, but and these the are decision. COVID filters. Is that what you're putting? Not in? specifically COVID for COVID. So there are specific but they, but COVID they, filters. No, no, I'm not correct. Let me <laughs> correct what I'm saying, ma'am. Okay. Um, they are. They are. We're going to use them for COVID, but we're also going to be able to use them in the buildings from now on. Okay. So uh, they're not just COVID. They're not built just for COVID. But we're putting them in here for this FEMA B request. They're COVID related. Right, I understand that. But what I'm saying we can is use them anyway. they, are, uh, they are designed, however, to limit the exposure to COVID based on the filter process. Is that correct, these air filters? Not, exact, not exactly. No. These are regular air filters that are helped to purify the air okay. for anything, including some of the elements <laughs> of COVID. But they are not designed specifically for COVID. Okay. How quick does the reimbursement? How quick would the reimbursement come back to us? Well, that's we don't we don't know, sir. That may be four years. We may be in just before the 2024 election. We'll be the office. Congress may pass something to say there's new money available and send it out uh, okay. everywhere Good. that needs COVID. We're assuming that we'll we'd like to get it back in six months to a year. 18 months is typical. Right now, the way they've been doing it, it's four years. And we just have to wait. That's why we put this million over here, and we, we know it's here, and we keep it, but we forget about it. it can't, it's not in your spending category. It's just going goes over there, and it stays. It won't go into uh, special projects, but we will put it in, in its own designation. Any additional questions? Does that help? Mm -hmm. Do we have a motion? Well, I'll move that the Board of Supervisors authorize and appropriate an additional $500,000 for a total maximum appro appropriation of $1 million in funds for COVID-19 response and recovery operations authorized and coordinated through the county administrator and uh, direct the county administrator to seek to recover such funds pursuant to the Stafford Act 42 USC 5121 uh, at SEG or any other appropriate funding source. Do we have a second? <coughs> Do we have a second? Second. Additional discussion concerns? Mr. Shiraki, could we get a roll call, please? Mr. Carter? Yeah, I'm on. Ms. Oates? Aye. Mr. Chairman? Aye. Ms. Colors? Aye. Mr. Fox? Aye. Thank you. You're crazy. Next item is the Warren County CARES Coronavirus Relief Funds. Mr. Farrell? Mr. Chairman, ladies and gentlemen, hello again. Um, very quickly, we completed uh, round two of small business, nonprofits, and utility grant assistance. At the conclusion of round two, we had approximately half a million dollars remaining between small business, nonprofits, and the utilities. It's about 430,000 and 61,000 respectively. All of the money that is left in the bank account with the chamber for the utilities, which is approximately $25,000, the chamber will cut us a check back and we will redeposit that money into our account and we will close out the utility account. Of the money that's remaining in the small business and nonprofit category, we are only recommending a very brief round three to address a very specific business population that was not considered by either the county or the town, and that is town businesses that are exempt from a business license. Very small population. Uh, by doing this, 
when I say we, both the county and the town, then we will have fully addressed town small business and county small business. We will have addressed the county nonprofits and the town nonprofits. We will have addressed county utility assistance, town utility assistance. And up until now, we also addressed county businesses that are not, uh, that are exempt from a business license. So this is the final category to keep things even across the board uh, for, for our locality. So we're asking for a very limited pot of $100,000 to address town businesses that are exempt from a license. <coughs> we keep it open for about a week. We start next week, we advertise, we get letters out to those that we know who would qualify in those categories. They're the same categories that Ms. Sowers explained uh, last time. And uh, we'll close that out at the end of uh, next week or early next and uh, call it good. All the rest of the funds then that are left over from that 100,000 would then roll into public safety just like we've uh, talked about before. And the rest of the funds, um, the other 400,000 or so, 300,000 or so today, we would roll into public safety. And I'll explain that in a, in a moment. So the, the really the nuts and bolts of the, uh, the motion really is just, it's a very brief round three, $100,000 only, and only for town exempt businesses. We will not include nonprofits in this round three. Uh, nonprofits would have been included by uh, definition, but we've already offered uh, both to county and town nonprofits already. Does this address the agribusiness? This would address agribusiness just like the county addressed it okay. in uh, round two. Yeah. Yes. So again, it's, you know, manufacturers at wholesale, agribusiness, some insurance companies publishing, you know, radio stations, newspapers, things like that. Questions from the board? Do we have a motion? I move that the Board of Supervisors of Warren County authorize and modify its prior allocations as follows. Number one, round three of CRF expeditions and reallocate and appropriate 100,000 of the remaining round two small business nonprofit CRF funds as follows. Open round three to town small businesses that are not required by law or local ordinance to have a business license. B, round three does not include county or town nonprofits. C, all other round one and round two requirements remain in effect. And number two, all other funds not expended from the round two small business nonprofit and individual utility assistance categories will be allocated to county public school, public safety payroll as previously BOS approved on October 6, 2020. And number three, at the end of round three, any remaining CRF funds not expended be further reallocated and appropriated for expenditure to public safety payroll, not to exceed $500,000, includes a balance of November and December costs, not previously BOS approved, until all such funds have been expended. And number four, the execution by the chairman of the Board of Supervisors of second of a second uh, addendum to the agreement with the Chamber of Commerce of Front Royal and Warren County for the use of Federal Cares Act coronavirus relief funds. Is there a second? I'll second it. Mrs. Shiraki, could we get a roll call, please? Mr. Fox? Aye. Ms. Colors? Aye. Mr. Chairman? Aye. Ms. Oates? Aye. Mr. Carter? C. Um, Mr. Ham, have you seen this? Yes, this, uh, this, in your this is the agreement for the uh, limited pot that you uh, have already drafted, and Ms. Foster's already signed it. Uh, the Chamber of Commerce second addendum, yeah, I, I wrote that. Yes. Oh, you did? Uh, okay for me to sign it? I'm, su I'm sure it is, yes, but... You can do that right now, which is passed, yes. Yeah. Thank you. I can ask you all to uh, pull out this yellow and orange and gray chart. The top of it says uh, Warren County, Virginia, CRF expenditure update, boss meeting November 4th as of November the 2nd. 
and I'll just uh, briefly walk you through this and let you know where we stand. So this chart is divided into a round one and a round two, approximately three and a half million and three and a half million. We'll start at the top of the chart. If you look at the 8,864.61, that is the round one individual utility assistance. It's yellow because I'm still waiting on two checks to clear. Once I get those checks back from Nikki, it'll turn orange and I'll get one of our CARES Act committee members just to do a final signature. We'll close it out. We'll have all the files we need for the audit. It'll turn green and I'm going to put the files away. The next 300,000 uh, that's at the at next, I have all the documentation uh, from the school, everything from the school request to the board approval to the cleared checks. And uh, Ms. Cullors and I are going to review that on Thursday. Once we're done with that, that'll become green, it'll be closed, and it'll go to the audit box. The next 864-631, uh, that is our payroll for public uh, safety employees for the month of July and August. Again, I'll take a look at that with Ms. Cullors on Thursday. We'll close that out and, and we'll be done with that. The 939-500 is our small business round one. We have all of the clear checks for all of those businesses. We'll close that out on Thursday, as well as the $60,000 that we had already given the county and the town to the chamber. We have all the documentation there. We'll close that out on Thursday as well. For round number two, uh, you'll see that first yellow box on the top that's blank. We had $40,000 there set aside for the audit. In talking to the auditors, they're not going to get to the audit before December 30th. So we're going to move the money uh, over into the general fund. We'll pay for the audit out of the uh, general fund come uh, the spring. We plan on doing the CARES Act audit late January, early February. It'll be a, just a very focused audit on just that, uh, that category. As you look down at the 16,628, that's actual expenditures for round two utility assistance uh, to county and town residents. Uh, we are waiting on final clear checks for those. Once those come in, I'll get one of you all on the committee to review it and we'll close those out. Coming down, uh, let me go back to the top real quick. For the town, you see that 967,500. That's what we have currently paid out to the town for their round one small business. We are waiting on approximately $309,000 in clear checks to come in for what I call the town one supplemental. The town is reawarding all of their businesses in round one a smaller check to finish off that, uh, that entire amount. That is in progress right now. We hope to have that done by Thanksgiving then that number will turn to the 1.276. We'll pay the town back and we'll be finished with uh, reimbursing the town for round one. All of town's round one money went to small business. As we come down on the bottom uh, left for the town, all of the town's round two allocation will go towards town public safety. I'm working with Mr. Wilson now on the documentation that we need to close that out. I should have their final documentation uh, today. I'll review it and then I'll ask two other uh, CARES committee members to uh, take a look at it. We'll close that out and then we'll write the check uh, to the town for 1.2 we will close out with the town for the second round. Their entire second round allocation goes to public safety. Uh, on the county side, you'll see in the middle column there, the 386,449, that's what we think we will have once our round two closes. That's the money we think that we'll be able to roll into additional public safety funds that we've not previously talked about. And then below that, the 800,000 is what we need to hold open for now to clear out, uh, to clear that account. So the 460 to the right of it is what we've spent to date on round two. And then uh, that'll include also 100,000 uh, as we just discussed. 
Below that, the 8572 are actual expenditures uh, that I'm working with uh, Angie at the courthouse on. Those are the expenditures required uh, to enable jury trials. So it's all the state Supreme Court mandates before she's allowed to reopen for jury trials. And then the final 200,000 in the bottom, that will be for public safety hazard pay. That will only be for the, uh, the sheriff's office and the fire and rescue employees that are in designated hazard duty positions as defined by VRS. Once uh, we get that straight, then you'll see the right-hand column populate there. Um, and then any money that's left over in any of the planning columns, we roll into public safety and we'll close out. I am very optimistic to be uh, done by Christmas. That's my goal. Sir. I've, um, in my travels, I found a group out in um, um, one of our sanitary districts where they had water issues and a small population have not done anything and they were quite in the rears on their water. Is there money still available for them? Because the water is considered a utility, correct? Uh, yes. Well, we just closed out with round two utility assistance. Uh, that would have been their time, well, either round one or round two, to have asked for that assistance. Okay. So they should not ask for it? Is that what you're saying? We would currently, round three would not be available for utility assistance. Okay. Is it a utility out there, sir? Yeah, it's uh, it's group water, basically. Group water. Yeah. Is it town water? No. no. It's a well. Probably it's a it's a, a group. it's a well that that's maintained by the group, mm -hmm. and it's distributed out to all of them, just like a little water authority out there. They get a bill. They get uh, delinquency notices. They get everything. So they just kind they of buy the water. Bill each other. Yeah, they bill each other through the sanitary okay. district. Thank you. Or through the HOA. Thank you. And there's there are some that are habitual offenders. I get that they should not be compensated. I guess, but there are those that have, that have been affected, and if they've been affected, we just found out like Monday. So if they have had, if they had been affected, we should be able to help. But if you're saying that we can't, I get that. If we've got extra money. We could, if that's what the board would like to do, we'll just come back and amend uh, our plans. But right now, our plans do not include any other utility assistance okay. currently. My question still would be, should they apply? Well, right now, there's nothing to apply to because okay. the, it's closed. Yeah. Okay. Any other questions on the CARES money? Thank you for the all right. detail. Yep. Yeah, thank you all very much. <laughs> thank you. So this chart has the same thing, and Lieutenant Furl's looked at all this, and it leaves the public safety at the bottom as an E. It leaves the bottom there as an E, because each of these numbers may be off just a little bit when we get down there. And so this number, the estimate, may change just a little bit. And then you can see how the money flows here. And right. can, you can keep this and keep track of it. And if I may... Uh, Beg the board's indulgence for just a moment, sir. Yes, sir. Uh, Jody, would you like to come up and play show and tell? Bring him up. Jody's been very busy this past month, extremely <laughs> busy, and this is one of her projects. Yes, we're happy about this project. Um, so I assume because I had to step away that we got approved earlier. Okay. So this is Keith McLiberty. Um, he's going to be joining us as our finance director at the end of the month. So we are super excited to have him on board. Um, and, and we think he's excited, right? <laughs> yeah, I am. I am. Thank you. Thank we you hope. Uh, 
I know you saw your cover sheet, uh, 25 years of municipal experience, so we're, we're very excited to have him join. Thank you very much. I, I know I met some of you or the others I hope to meet today this afternoon. I do, do look forward to joining Dr. Daly and Jody and the team. Uh, I will be coming down a couple times navigating the COVID policy uh, and working remotely before June 30th so that come November. To, uh, November 30th. <laughs> <laughs> You're really going to scare him if you say uh, June. <laughs> so come uh, November 30th, we're off and running and we can continue the, the work that's been started. So thank you again. Well, thank you. Thank we, you. Are, we are particularly excited about the fact that Keith has experience as an elected treasurer mm -hmm. and he has worked with school districts before. So we, we think he brings those two particular bonus categories to us. And Keith has a bachelor's in finance and a master's in finance and business. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Keith. Thank you, Jody. Do we want to, someone want to read us into uh, close the meeting? We're going to go into closed session? Yes, ma'am. Okay. I move the board mm -hmm. enter into a closed meeting under the provisions of Section 2.2-3711A3 of the Virginia Freedom of Information Act for the discussion or consideration of the acquisition of real property for a public person where discussion in an open meeting would adversarially affect the bargaining position or negotiating strategy of the public body. I further move that the discussion be limited to the property lo located in the South River Magistorial District outside of the limits of the town of Front Royal. I also move the board enter into a closed meeting under the provisions of Section 2.2-3711A3 of the Virginia Freedom of Information Act for the discussion or consideration of the disposition of a publicly held real property where discussion in an open meeting would have adversely affect the bargaining position or negotiating strategy of the public body. I further move that the discussion be limited to the property located in the Fort Magisterial District outside of the town limits of the town of Fort Royal. Finally, I move the board enter into a closed meeting under the provisions of section 2.2-3711A7 and A8 of the Virginia Freedom of Information Act for the consultant consultation with legal counsel pertaining to actual or probable litigation and the provision of legal advice regarding the industrial development authority of the town of Front Royal and the county of Warren, Virginia, the EDA, the town of Front Royal, the EDA versus Jennifer McDonald at all, the town of Front Royal versus the EDA at all, and other potential claims and litigations relating to other possible liabilities of the EDA and the recovery of EDA funds and assets. Second. In the discussion, can we get a roll call, please? Mr. Carter. Aye. Ms. Oates. Aye. Mr. Chairman. Aye. Ms. Colors. Aye. Mr. Fox. Aye. We are in closed session. You want to take like five or ten? Sure. Mm -hmm.